Welcome back to the Rebotchables. Joining me for episode number two are my good friends Mark Susco and Andy Shields. I am Mike Hilsenrath. In this current week of quarantine, we decided to throw it back to 1995 and watch Die Hard with a Vengeance, starring Bruce Willis, Samuel L. Jackson, and Jeremy Irons. This movie came out on May 19th, 1995. It was budgeted for $90 million. It made $366 million and was the number one movie in the world in 1995. Monster. It beat, it beat out the likes of Toy Story, GoldenEye, Batman Forever, Apollo 13, Seven, Waterworld, Jumanji, and Outbreak, which I threw in just for, for now. Outbreak, nice. <laughs> Uh, didn't, uh, it only, didn't it only win global box office sales because of its international revenue? Yes. So it only made 100 in America, but it made 266 worldwide. Okay. Who, who watched, what country watched this movie the most outside of America? <laughs> I'm guessing Germany. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> or, or, or not it's, Germany. It's some Hungarian separatists. <laughs> yeah, or not Germany. <laughs> People who hated Germany. Uh, I was going to say maybe the Hungarian separatist army. Yeah, yes. Austrians. Um, I would say it's the highest grossing Die Hard film. Number one made 140. Number two made 240. This made 366. Four made 383, but that was in 2007. So I think inflation, inflation adjusted. This is crushing that. And then the most recent one made only 300 million in 2013. So commercially, I think it's the most successful diehard of them all. I don't know what number one has done in residuals, but yeah, I don't know. This one's on TV just as much. I feel like no diehard two is never on, but this one is do, on. Do you guys think these are still on TV? I feel like I never encounter them anymore. I feel like I did maybe 10 or 15 years ago, but now I don't know. I, I feel like I never yeah. come across them like TNT or TBS. All three of them just got picked up by HBO. That's how I watch. Yeah. Yeah, that's how I watched all. I actually watched all the movies again and watching and rewatching for this. But yeah, they're all on HBO now, so that's that's a big chunk there. I know Die Hard and Die Hard with a Vengeance are on all the time. I never see Die Hard too. Um, are we yeah. even including, are we even including two, four, and five in the discussion of Die Hard movies? Or they four and five for sure not. I mean, I, I feel like they don't exist. It's I don't like, I like four. I like yeah. four a lot. Four is good. Yeah. Five is really dumb. <laughs> Five, they're they're going for paychecks. And five happens. is like a five is more of like a superhero movie than it is a diehard movie. Overall, what did you guys think of three on the We Watch? I watched it twice this week, and it's it's pretty great that it's just like nonstop action. I think it's twenty minutes too long, but I can get over that because it, like once it starts, it just really doesn't stop. Yeah, I, uh, I I thought it was just like fun to watch, like a classic action comedy, not too much CGI, uh, just like a great plot, a few twists. Um, you know, prime Bruce Willis, prime Samuel Jackson. Um, but yeah, I, I agree. I think it's like a little too long and it goes a little overboard in like the last hour. Um, but I mean, I, I super very very much enjoyed it. Yeah. The first hour is definitely better than the second hour. Um, yes. No question. I've got a lot of, I mean, there's a lot of reasons behind that that we can get into. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll get into I watched it this movie for the first time way too early, like way too early. I think I was, I think it was right as it came out on VHS, which would have been like 95, 96. Um, yeah. And I watched it at my friend's house because my older brother and his friend were watching and I didn't understand anything that was going on in this movie. Like, I didn't, I, I hadn't also seen Die Hard. I hadn't seen the first one. So I had mm -hmm. no idea who Hans Gruber was. It also ruined the ending of Die Hard for me before I even got to see it. Because you see the clip of Hans falling off the building. Uh, I didn't understand any of the racism or any of the jokes about being hungover. <laughs> like, I didn't know what that, what that meant. But, like, I was going to ask before we get started, can you guys imagine... Having a night out, like ripping beers and shots at Angry Wade's until three in the morning, and then waking up the next day and someone telling you you have to go on a bomb scavenger hunt at eight o'clock. No, no. It, and like think these answers to these like complex riddle questions or <laughs> semi-complex riddles, like when you're hungover, it's the last thing. 
<laughs> we'll, we'll get into that too. I've got. I got remember. I, I also, for me, it was the first Die Hard that I saw, and I remember watching it on uh, HBO, like as a kid, because it had N and it had SS for like strong sexual situations and nudity. Yeah. But all there is is that weird sex scene at the end that's like two seconds long. But like I remember, like watching this entire movie, like waiting for that because that's what you did <laughs> when you, when the HBO came on. Like you right. saw that there was an. You were just waiting. You know, I think the end is Bruce Willis like getting undressed in the beginning. Like, I was like no where's the, the nudity? Um, is the nudity yeah. is the nudity for is the nudity for Katya taking her shirt off, or is the nudity I, for John McClane and his boxers? I think it's John McClane and his boxers. Uh, so sitting well, around waiting for 120 minutes just to see a nipple. Yes. Um, so our friend Roger Ebert gave this film three out of four stars. It was a little, it was a weirdly written review because it didn't seem like he liked it, but then he still gave it three out of four stars. I think he just like decided to do away with being serious. He said, uh, it used to just be James Bond movies that provided us with this, but now there are movies that are essentially nothing but sensational stunt sequences one after another, each one a feat of staging until we're reeling in our seats from input overload. Die Hard with a Vengeance is the kind of movie where towards the end, you start looking for the kitchen sink. I'm surprised he gave it three out of four stars. Yeah. I wouldn't have guessed what that. Did he give, what did he give the first one? I did not look that up. If it's, uh, less, if it's less than that, I would be mad. But he also he's right said, about the kitchen sink. There could be a, a little film festival on one of the cable channels consisting of only scenes where experts try to defuse bombs, which I agree with. Uh, oh, that's awesome. <laughs> which is I pretty prescient for uh, 1995 Roger Ebert. Could you I give two also, stars, two stars to the I, first, first film. I would also wow. like to add a channel right next to the bomb defusing channel where movies and heroes only solve puzzles devised by the villains <laughs> yes for yes. sure i have that for what's oh, the best for sure uh uh rotten tomatoes only 52 percent of critics like it 83 percent audience uh a little shocking there i don't i mean what's not to like did critics not i mean there's a lot not to like we can, yeah. <laughs> we're gonna go there <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> What is it? I, I can't imagine that critics like. I mean, action movies and horror movies are always things that the critics fail at recognizing are good. That's right? true. Good yeah, action. I think fifty percent is a good. I don't understand it. I don't care about critic ratings. From a couple uh, other things action. that Ebert said before we get started, just to keep in the back of your mind, we'll we'll hash them out later. He says towards the end, I'm a little hazy on how the Chucks got to Canada, and he said. <laughs> Jeremy Irons uses a certain clipped precision of speech that makes everything he says sound resentful. So he, I guess, liked Jeremy Irons' speech in this movie, where others might have differing viewpoints on that. Yeah. But I, mean, I, I could see any critic liking Jeremy Irons. It's the accent, his delivery. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> um, we can talk a lot about, you mentioned like not sure how they got to Canada. Um, we can talk a lot about the locational and travel logistics of this movie. <laughs> I have yes. almost I have like an entire section on this. <laughs> but we all have, we do all have knowledge of New York and I don't think any of it's that ridiculous. It is ridiculous uh... that it all happens in one day. The, the yeah. timing of a lot of things, I think, is up for <laughs> <laughs> Let's not get into this. I have a whole okay. section. Okay. All right. All right. New Let's York. get started. Uh, most rewatchable scene. I did. Uh, I have five, as I did last time. You guys can add on at the end. I tried to be a lot more specific with my scene choosing this time. <laughs> um, the first scene is the Harlem scene, uh, which starts when Bruce Willis shows up in the sign. Uh, actually, no, it starts, yeah, you see a quick shot of Bruce Willis with the sign, and the old lady gives him that, like, disapproving nod, and then you get the speech from Samuel L. Jackson talking to the two little kids, like, who do we not want to help us? White people. Who's going to do it with us? No one. Um, great speech, get, and then you get the respect. 
expect, yes. <laughs> I, I think the way they shot that scene is fantastic, too, because they, they film him, like, getting out of the truck. They don't show what's on the sign. They show people's yes. reactions to him walking down the street. So you don't even know what's going on, but you know something bad's, like, about to happen. It's, like, a great suspenseful way it's shot. I thought they did a good job with it. Yes. And you don't see it until Samuel Jackson comes outside and it kind of does that like 90s movie, like pull out, like yeah. to reveal him standing there. I did read I that uh, for, for, sorry, for the, for the TV version, they put, I hate everyone on the side. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I also like the line, uncle, there's a white man on the street. And Samuel <laughs> just goes, I seen one. <laughs> <laughs> Not like I this. Wanna, Not like this. I want to know what poor cop would have had the task of making that sign. <laughs> <laughs> Great question. <laughs> Probably <laughs> unanswerable question right there. Which cop yes. fucked like what gumshoe fucked up earlier in that week? Or they're like, yeah. hey, you gotta pick this sign, go get some paint. Yeah. Oh, that's um, great. And just like the initial Samuel L. He just like comes out so hard. Like this is the first time you're meeting him. Like probably the first movie that I've ever seen him in, and he's just like going crazy with Bruce Willis right there. He's like, you know, not all his dogs are barking. <laughs> Looney Tunes, <laughs> like from Bellevue. Uh, Bellevue. <laughs> it's just phenomenal. Um, it's also really getting... smart too, because then then they explain like you think why if this guy just said who do we not want to help us white people what the hell is he doing pointing a gun at all the guys that stand that stand across the street from him every day to help this white yeah. cop that he's never met that's wearing a sign that hates that basically a hate crime sign on his mm -hmm. chest and you find out that it's just to protect his neighborhood like he. You can you tell you know already that Zeus is going to be the smart yeah. one of the two, thinking three to four steps ahead. If one white cop gets shot in Harlem next week, we got a hundred white cops. Yes, it's prescient uh, in terms of like what happened like a couple years ago in the city with you know police yeah. murdering like a black guy or Black Lives Matter, like all that. Uh, it's yeah, interesting. The the gang is a little over the top, but I can I can deal with that. <laughs> I mean. <laughs> that guy's got a the guy who underhand tosses the knife yeah. right inside. Yeah. That is awesome. I feel like they're way too cool at first. Like where they would just like this would just be a bum rush situation, like, no questions asked. Where yeah. they come up and they like taunt him for a little bit, like <laughs> throw the basketball at his head. Yeah. <laughs> and that scene ends with the cab, and then. He's calling him Jesus, and he's like, my name's not Jesus, motherfucker. Yeah. <laughs> Which yeah, I, we can talk One of the about best quotes in the movie. Quotes, but yes. Yeah. Uh, just a great way to get off and going. Um, I also like in that scene with the cab driver, after he realizes he's not getting robbed, but he's still got a gun pointed at him, McLean's like, just run all the lights, run all the lights. And out of reflex, the cab driver goes, whatever you say, boss. <laughs> 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 Like normal New York cabbie, yeah, they'll do whatever you want. <laughs> two of his, two of his passenger side windows have just been smashed to smithereens, and he's still like, "All right, you guys want to get this?" Scene number two, I have. Speaking of cabs, the other cab scene in the movie, which is through the park, on court, we can call this the uh, subway bomb scene, I guess. The through the park with the cab. Then they, they split up through the bomb exploding. We can have that as the whole scene, I think. Um, I timed it out today during quarantine. 72nd and Broadway to Central Park South would have only taken you six minutes, whereas he did it in three. So I'm guessing. What, what do you mean it would only take you six minutes? Just if there's you're... no cars on the road right now. Oh, oh okay. I Google mapped <laughs> it. It's just said six minutes. So, like, okay. <laughs> Obviously, during rush hour, I'm sure this is taking like an hour. But it's funny that right now that that drive only takes you six minutes, and you don't have to almost kill like 500 people in the park. Right. So that yeah, scene, I, I was calling that one 72nd and Broadway to Wall Street Station in 30 minutes. Um, it's 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 got so many cool like movie tropes where you think something is going to happen one way. Zeus is the ex. Zeus is apparently the expert he used to drive the cab. He's telling McLean how to get somewhere. McLean's going completely off the rails 
ballistic yes. instead of going through the park drive, going right through the park. I don't know when the last time I saw a mime was in Central Park. <laughs> I was like, are you aiming for these people? He goes, no, maybe that mime. 90s, though, I thought like that was a common thing, mimes. Shouting and then the there's park. also, this is where I learned about following, this is, this is the movie where I learned about if you see any emergency vehicle with its lights on and you're yes. on a crowded street, you get immediately behind them and follow them, like, they talk yeah. about following what we need is an ambulance. Like follow the yeah. blocker at the end zone. Yeah, the uh, the drive through the park is the the flashy thing, but I think that the following the ambulance is like the the most baller move of the whole scene. It's so great Brilliant. the way he calls it in. <laughs> yeah, like, and then he knows that exactly that they have to stop at 14th Street because that's where their territory ends. And like, yes. then he's got to then they have to split up. Like it's great. The baller move. Yeah, the baller move is knowing which hospital or which intersection he has to call. The shooting in to get the, the ambulance to go from the right hospital. Yes. And this is wait, we didn't talk about this is the first Die Hard movie in New York where McLean is actually a cop. Yes, it was, this is the first time LA, we see him in New York City. LA, yeah. DC. Now it's he's, now he's, he's actually working in his jurisdiction. This is the first time. Yeah, <laughs> which you yes. could also argue he's dumber in his own jurisdiction than he is in the other two, where he doesn't <laughs> he's not familiar. And who knows? Has he even been working since the other events of the other two movies, or no? It seems like he's just been in a bender on suspension. Unclear. Yeah, that's true. Um, it's true. Cigarettes. Ninety, blo 90 blocks in thirty minutes. Pretty impressive. Uh, the amount of destruction that they cause is ridiculous. They almost kill like two hundred people, like alone. Like when he jumps the cab at the end onto Central Park South, like he could have <clears throat> really, really hurt some yeah. people there. Did anyone um, notice that he knocks he knocks a wheel off of a car? Yes, yes. <laughs> I didn't pick up on that. An entire wheel comes flying off of another vehicle that he hits on his way over. Uh, you get the some quotes in there. Uh, I didn't say park drive. I said through the park. At one point, Samuel Jackson goes, "How do like, Catholics do that thing?" And he's just like, "North, okay. south, east, west." <laughs> and he does that. <laughs> uh, then when they split up. Uh, which obviously, if McLean would just would have stayed in the car, everything would have been fine. He probably still would have set the bomb off anyway, but he wasn't expecting Zeus to get there in time. I don't think it's right? a picking nit for me. Yeah, it, it's a picking nit. Them splitting then he, up. Them splitting up. Yeah. Yeah. Well, he's trying to go after the bomb. I get. I get it. it. I get but, it. I get it. Yeah. My favorite part from when he splits up is when he initially gets on the subway. He's like storming through. And this one lady, like, has this crazy reaction when he tries to go by her. She's like, Lah! Oh, uh, she's... <laughs> are we... Can we do, can we do the, 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 the They Knew Award right now? <laughs> no, you can't give it to somebody like that. But she, what is she like, doing? like, ah! <laughs> She comes out of nowhere. Like, I still, I didn't understand why she was so upset when I watched it when I was 10, and I still don't know why she's that upset today yeah. in New York with people he's who are- He's clearly very... a police officer, too. It's not like he's some crazy guy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then Zeus getting the, uh, the gun pulled on him. Obviously, he knew that was going to happen in New York City in 1995. Uh... So there's, a, there's a lot of cool- I'm gonna, I was going to save this, but this scene has a lot of cool- like, there's a lot of things that McTiernan didn't get right about New York, but there are a lot of things that he does get right. And this scene has a bunch of them. So one of my favorite lines in the entire, in that whole sequence is, and I think it's aged really well too, is even in the midst of trying to stop a bomb from going off in the middle of Manhattan, someone still gets really pumped about making record time traveling from one place to another. <laughs> to New York. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> To yeah, brag about good. it, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Seventy Second Street to Central Park South in three minutes, and he's like laughing to himself. Yeah, it's, a very, it's like a Costanza moment. We're making That's great, great time. <laughs> and then I, I, the top... oh, go ahead, Mike. No, no, no. I was you go for it. The I, I, I'm not sure why the cop, and this could just be a reflection of 1990s police racism in Manhattan too. But Zeus just jumps. He just like avoids the fair. Right, that's all he does. He jumps over the yeah, so over happens the, every day, jumps right. the fence. That happens all the time. No way is anyone pulling a gun on this guy. No, just no, it's crazy. 
going yeah. down to the, the subway station trying to answer a phone. Yeah, he, he's overdoing it. And uh, I mean, I guess he Zeus does force that other guy off the phone, though. I mean, maybe that's why the cop kind of freaked out. I don't know. But yeah, way overdone his reaction. Yeah, I agree. Jenna pointed this out when we were watching it today that this most of the subway logic is spot on. Like they take the right trains, which I always appreciate. Oh, that's interesting. Be- I pick right up on that. Stations. Yeah. <laughs> Different subways back then. I got I got some I got some some issues with that one, but we can talk about that in picking nets. Yes. But they're the right stations, the right trains at least. Uh, nice. that one. In this scene, it's the that right one. one. It's yes. the, it's 72nd and Broadway to Wall Street. But that's the most important one. So that's what are they the taking? Stop. The four, five, six, or the two, the, no, the two, two three? three. Yeah, two, three. Yeah. The, the bomb's yeah. on the three train. Got it. The the explosion itself is also ridiculous. Can we just do this now? Can I just can I just talk about this right now? Sure. If we're talking about this scene. The best way to get from 72nd and Broadway to Wall Street Station in 30 minutes is to just get on the fucking train that the bomb is on right then and there. There's a subway stop at that intersection. It's arriving. They just need to get off the phone and get down. It would take 20 minutes to get to Wall Street Station. If you get the 2-3, it's express. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's- but the, I think the train that had the bomb was already like passing underneath them. No, it's, he right? said it's arriving. It's arriving now. And it's, so there's no way they could have gotten down on it then. They're at the intersection with the subway stop. Either way, it's really express close. train. Another one's coming five minutes after. It takes 20 minutes to get from that station to Wall Street Station. They could have gotten they there. They would have with- been late. They would have been late because the train explodes as it arrives at the station. That's right? true. They would have, right, 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 right. They, they, they could have went to like. Behind, they would have just been stuck at the, at the previous stop waiting for the bomb to explode. Why is the bomb explode? That's true. I thought I was probably watching this scene like there's no way that they needed to drive through Central Park. <laughs> and they, they could have drove to Penn Station and tried to get the train there. You know, I, no, I it's know. essentially what he does. There's, right? there's a lot of different ways you could have handled. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think there should be another section of what would as as people that take the subway all the time in New York. How would we have gotten to Wall Street <laughs> Station? <laughs> Or any of the things that they do. Yes. Um, all right. That's scene number two. Uh, the third scene I have written down for me is the water fountain bomb scene. Uh, just the two of them figuring out the riddle with the, the water jugs and the, uh, you were going to call me a, no, I was going to call you an asshole. Uh, <laughs> He's clearly going to call him a motherfucker. Yeah. <laughs> the dialogue. And Zeus just makes up that he's going to call him the N-word. Yeah. And then he's like, I think you hate me. He's like, no, I hate you because you're going to get me killed. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, it's a fun guys... math problem. <laughs> yeah. Fun How math do you guys problem. feel about that math problem? Like, I, Can we, oh. I get it, but I don't really, but I kind of don't get it. I like it. Do you want to solve it now? Really? You, you don't get it? Like, I, I don't get that he figured it out in that one exact moment and they were able to do the pouring. Well, they, they, they kind of cut away. They don't actually show the actual solvent, if you like. They, like, they assume that they already filled up one of the things. and So you so fill up the cut... five. Yeah. Yes. Five into the three. Then you're left with two. You're left with two. Yeah. And you pour out the three. Yeah. So you, just, you still just have two in the five. Yeah. And... Then you uh, pour the remaining, remaining... You put the two in the three. You put the two yes. in the three. Two and the three, and then you have one gallon of empty space. That's and that's where they that's where they cut back in. Yeah. Because you've got yeah. one gallon of empty space inside of the three gallon jug. Fill the five gallon up, right. pour out the one gallon, you're left with four Into gallons. The, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay. That was gonna be one it of my other questions though. was how how far in the riddle in the riddle game would you guys have gotten before you got blown up? <laughs> I don't know if I would have gotten the St. Ives one. I would have probably spent way too much time multiplying sevens together, and then just that would have been it. Same. Yeah, no chance. I think I would have made it. I would have made it through that one. I played a lot of Mind Trap growing up, which was just all just a box of Trivial Pursuit cards that was all just filled with trick questions. So I would have gotten that one. Probably would have figured out the water jug. I would have. I would have gotten way too deep into twenty-one out of forty-two. I would have gone some weird. Route and yes, get up there. Yes, well, it only is it only makes it easier because the 42nd president was in office at the time, 
True. Right. Right. Yeah. It's true. true. But if uh, they were like, I, what's today? If they were like, what's twenty three out of forty five? Yeah, no, you're right. I wouldn't. I wouldn't have any answer to that. No. no and that's instantly, true. when I hear the number of forty two, I think of Jackie Robinson. So my mind's already on baseball. And I'm in the wrong. Yeah. You know. Yankee Stadium. Yeah. 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 Um, Great riddle. So I like that. I like that scene a lot. Um, the next scene is a little tougher. I just call it the boat scene, which is a long sequence because there's a lot that happens on the boat, and then they're cutting back to the school. But I can, we can just call it all the boat, like from them jumping on to then Samuel having his confrontation with Jeremy Irons and Bruce Willis meets Jeremy Irons. You get both meetings individually back to back, which are pretty great. And then at the same time, you have the the lovely bomb squad guy trying to do his thing back at the school with the kids locked. Charlie. So it's a, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I love Charlie. We'll get, we'll I love uh, Charlie. Yeah. Uh, I have him nominated for some awards. So, yeah, uh, but that whole sequence is great. I mean, are you starting? Out, so where, where are you, are you starting from when they, are you starting start from, from the, them jumping on from the, the shootout scene on the highway or starting from when they see no. the boat coming and they have to, they have yes. to tie the truck to or get yeah. the, the cord Anything, on the truck. Anything boat related, I think, is fair. Okay. So them immediately getting on, like Samuel L. or Zeus, I gotta keep, I gotta call him Zeus, uh, thinking that he can make the jump like on his own, and then them doing that ridiculous wench setup, which I still don't really understand what happened there. The special effects are terrible on it. Um, yeah. Wait, the what setup? When when they jump on the boat, the special effects of them falling are terrible. Um, it's like the yeah. weakest part of the movie. Um, they. They do show, <laughs> they do get the guy getting cut in half by the cables. <laughs> yes. I yes. remember when, when we were on VHS watching that, I had never really seen Gore before because I'm 10 years old. And I was like, wait, what just happened? You're fascinated by things that you're not supposed to be watching because if your parents found you watching it, they'd just destroy mm -hmm. it. I remember trying to get the VHS to stop at the precise moment when his body got cut in half. Yeah. <laughs> Um, they got and then they right. yeah they get on the boat and he hands him the gun and he's like what you think all brothers know how to shoot guns uh, <laughs> which is actually like one of the funnier jokes that like comes back to be useful because um, then he can't and fire the gun right and McLean doesn't know how to fire it either he tells him he tells him to pull back the slide yeah. but he never tells him to take the safety off <laughs> I know <laughs> some terrible advice <laughs> um. But the McLean fight also in the bottom of the boat is really awesome when he beats that that awful Tar guy with the chains. Targo. Yeah. Go. Targo. Yeah. Yeah. Number two. And then just cutting even you, you just like everything gets amped up because you're cutting back to the guy like holding the wires and with the clippers and like it's just like a great just drama building. Like this for me, this should have been the end of the movie, but it's not. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. I agree. It's, right. it's the, cool. The They're on the bridge. Yeah. Yeah. I, I agree. Yeah. It is really cool the way that they it's it's kind of hard to in, in really enclosed spaces on boats. I think something that movies do really poorly is like if you watch like U571 boat like submarine movies, it's really hard to figure out the geography of the boat, like where things are in relation to other things because everything's so claustrophobic. This mm -hmm. one does a good job of using camera angles and panning to show where Zeus is in relation to the front of the ship to when Katya comes out to smoke the cigarette down that hallway, you understand kind of the logistics of where everybody is and how Zeus is moving through those hallways to mm -hmm. the bottom, to the, what is it called? The command center? What do they call it? I don't even know. <laughs> the deck, yeah. right? The, the, the deck, deck. Yeah. Or, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. They yeah, call it a good. flight deck just, on the boat. It's just well done. It's claustrophobic. <laughs> it's, it's claustrophobic, uh, but you know where everything is at the same time. You have a good sense of being able to zoom out and see yes. where he's going. And then just like the speech about the brothers, everything was great there. Like, I thought you said you hated your brother. And he's like, well. I have this in best court, back and forth. Uh, uh, that's a good he says there's a, difference, there's a difference, you know, between not liking one's brother and not caring when some dumb Irish flatfoot drops him out of a window. <laughs> Very wise. Yes. Uh, is that where they show the flashback to Die Hard One? Is yeah. it in that scene? I forget. No, no. no. They, it's early. The okay. FBI guys tell him that uh, it's a group. It's his brother. Okay. And he's like, does the name Gruber mean anything to you? And it like does that like '90s like. Mm -hmm. That's right. Uh, but I didn't say that. That 
that snippet from the previous movie is so short. It's literally like three seconds. Yes, because they like. probably have to like Alan Rickman gets paid like every frame he's on the scene. Oh. So like, I'm guessing that's what. Oh, it really? is. But you really have to know Die Hard to kind of context and I, I don't know. He's crazy in the movie. Then the minute, yeah. if you if you've only seen this movie, like I didn't understand what it was, but then the minute that you see Hans Gruber show up in the first frame that he's on screen, you're like, oh, this guy's falling off a fucking building. Great. <laughs> like I know yeah. this is. <laughs> yeah. 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 That's um, a great scene. And then the last scene, even though I just said the movie should have ended, I have the end, which starts with the most one of the most awkward sex scenes in movie history. <laughs> <laughs> and then I don't know what's going on there. Like they rip each other's clothes off, but they don't talk. They don't even kiss. Uh, it's, it's not a weird sexual at all. It's not. It's not pleasant to watch. <laughs> I want to like fast forward it when it's on. And then, like them coming with the helicopter. You like, waited like 120 like, minutes for that when you were growing up. <laughs> for nothing. Yeah, I know, right. <laughs> But then they come with the helicopter, and he's like, "I think you pissed her off." Like, and then she starts shooting. Like, oh, that's how great. They, how, how the hell did they see them, yeah. and vice versa? There's no way anyone saw you. <laughs> I used to use that line all the time when, when like, as a group of kids would piss people, would like make people mad. I used to use yeah. his line all the time. I think she's pissed at you, McLean. <laughs> <laughs> and why is Zeus even there to begin with? How do they? Why do they let him go? He's yeah. not a police officer. He He's been be shot in the leg. Fucking bodega, which has already been yeah. ransacked by this point. Oh, uh, and he got <laughs> shot in the leg. Like, so, yeah, but He's the whole shot action shot sequence. Like, what, yeah. what insight is he going to add at this? I guess he was the one that solved all the puzzles, right? Yeah. yeah. They so if for a future puzzle, who knows? I don't know. Yeah, but that whole sequence is great. Like their helicopter goes down, they get off, and then he shoots the helicopter down with the power line transformer trick. There it's was great. really it's great. no need it's really for that great. sex scene at all. No need. <laughs> if they just put that in there, there was no need for it. It, it didn't serve disagree. any purpose. I disagree. Really? Yeah, I think so. In the um, Mike, were those your re rewatchable scenes? Yeah, I'm done. Those are my five. Okay, I've got a couple more to add, yeah, um, and I'll, I'll I'll loop this right back into this this point. So I think another rewatchable scene is the Simon identity reveal in the van with the FBI guys. Mm -hmm. um, that's a great one when he's yeah. going through when he's going through that list that report of the three people it's it's simon it's targo it's katia yeah Ta katia and targo are together right they they themselves are like the radical fascists who believe in this cause right and the and simon is the one who believes but also is the 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 maker of the, the creator of the heist yeah so you think that these two radicals are going to stick together by their principles. And when they figure out that Simon has betrayed the cause by stealing all the gold instead of blowing it all up, you would think that Katya is going to turn on Simon, mm -hmm. but she turns on Targo and it's because yes. Simon and Katya have been, Got have been fucking the whole time. So okay. there's, yeah. there's a part of it. It ties into the betrayal of Targo. A bit. All right. But I'll buy that. They just I'll needed like to that. show them going up and like they just needed like the sexy champagne sip and then the walk up the stairs. They didn't yeah. need the violence and <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so I got the mouth all over the place. <laughs> the scene that you were talking about is great where he's he's like calling out the FBI guys too and he's like that one uh, guy, he's like, I bet you're chewing on your glasses too. Like <laughs> Bill, uh, yeah, yeah. Cross, so I assume that's a also great scene. Bill, still trying to butch up by chewing on your glasses. Yeah, that's a great scene. And, and, and uh, the other rewatchable scene I had. Um, well, let's talk about the van scene. So it's you got if it's a diehard move, it's going to be a good diehard movie. You got to have um, incompetent <laughs> FBI guys. I just think <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and like these guys are just like throwing. Hungarian expats and a former East German army colonel. Like they're throwing <laughs> pictures in front of yeah. McLean. Makes sense because it's Gruber's brother. But they're asking Zeus if he's noticed anything strange <laughs> in the past few weeks, too. <laughs> like this, this is a fucking Harlem electrician who just came into the mix 30 minutes ago. And you're asking yes. him if like 
he's he recognizes any of these Hungarian or East German expats. <laughs> what are you doing, FBI? Yeah. <laughs> well, the other guy's supposed to be from the CIA, right? I'm guessing because they the say he like, yeah, the guy with the chews on his glasses. They say he's from like somewhere. They don't like to give away where he works. Larry. Not the guy with the chews on his glasses. The guy with the sunglasses in the back who says okay. that it's Simon Peter Ruber. But that's yeah. it's a good scene because it it shows a couple of things. It shows um, that Simon's got an eye on everybody. He's done his homework. He's yeah. extremely menacing. He knows exactly what he's doing. He knows who's going to be involved once this plan starts to take place. Mm-hmm. And it actually reveals some of Simon's motives. So like one of the the coolest things about this movie is that you never see. You don't know, like, in other action movies, there's, like, the MacGuffin of, you know, the nuclear bomb gets stolen or the chemical weapon gets stolen right at the beginning of the movie. And then it's a chase to figure out what that mm-hmm. is. The MacGuffin in this movie is, why is Simon doing this? What's what's pushing this plot forward? It's like, we're figuring out why this is happening. And all we know is that this guy's after McLean, and he's got this series of really, we'll say, well thought out puzzles for this guy to go through and we don't figure out why he's targeting McLean until this moment. And I think he shows how, how good of a villain he is, how well thought out this plot is. And also we figure out what his actual motives are. Totally. Yeah. I think it's it's a great scene. You're right. I agree. And my other one is the Charlie's introduction of the binary liquid where he blows up the chair. Yeah. I okay. always like I, had, I always <laughs> like the mechanism of like how like yeah. how dangerous is the thing that we're dealing with. Yeah, yes. things are Great always thing. fun to learn about. I have uh, one more to add. I love the uh, when Bruce, uh, McLean goes to the Federal Reserve in New York and he sees the German cop posing as the guard there, and they go up in the elevator. Yeah, this is the I German this one off. The German cops like speaking these Americanisms like off he's like it's raining yes. dogs and cats or cats yeah. and, dogs. <laughs> and then they get in the elevator it's so suspenseful he's like anybody played the lottery last night my wife says like those are my numbers <laughs> it's great it's great I love that scene yeah and then he goes I got I got my numbers right here <laughs> boom 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 like, uh, oh, yeah I don't that know was my everybody's mentioned. dead yeah. yeah I feel like it's going to rain like dogs and cats every day <laughs> <laughs> you just tell something's a little off about to go down uh, and that's yeah. that's the moment too where in the in the beginning of the movie like a guy just blew up a department store on fifth avenue a man has called clearly a terrorist who has these demands they put mclean in the back of a, of a paddy wagon and mm-hmm. yet they're not talking about what he's got to do or where they're going to be. They're talking about, like, they, they dedicate two minutes to talking about the fucking lottery. <laughs> I know. <laughs> but then you, you realize that the lottery numbers actually lead to him not dying and figuring out that exactly. the batch number is, is Walsh's, who's been killed by Otto. Yeah. I would still say my favorite rewatchable is the 72nd and Broadway to Wall Street for me. It's just, it's too good. I think it's, uh, I, I love the opening scene. I, I had forgotten that, to be honest, rewatching this. And then, yeah, put that second. Like you mean the Harlem place. the Harlem scene? Yes, the Harlem scene. Yeah. Okay. I'm going 72nd and Broadway to Wall Street Station in 30 minutes. Yeah. And I'm, I'm going to include the scene up to that where they're solving the riddle of St. Ives. Five 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 zero zero zero. Yeah, that's a great, yeah. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, okay. Um, what has aged the best uh i have a bunch here uh <laughs> N- new york city in the 90s this is just great it looks like a hopping place the fashion well, it's, it's nice to see people together <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. Maybe that's walk it. in yeah. the streets <laughs> i think well well that's probably age the worst then <laughs> you can't do it anymore <laughs> um I, I, there's something about like the old school cabs and police cars that I love. I love the square. Like I feel like cabs and police cars should still have to have the square like aspect to them. Like I'm it just in. makes it. Yeah, they're more intimidating. Uh, I will say that they are. Cop car. Yeah. <laughs> um, I have villains who create puzzles. I'm in immediately. 
Yes. <laughs> like Simon says, totally. I want to play a game called Simon Says. Like, are you kidding me? Like, <laughs> let's go. Like, I want to solve all these puzzles right now. <laughs> Uh, what do I, I don't know if you guys have like a list? Is are there other great villains you could think of that were kind of like that posing riddles or uh, I can't think of any off the top of my head. You know what I mean? Like like Simon S. Yeah, seven. Yeah, good call. Seven. The game out this year. Um, yeah, that's kind of a, I was I was gonna say that the the scavenger hunt style has really aged well. Like these are my favorite type yeah. of action. It's like I don't. I, I I don't care about the the net, like the action scenes like people getting out of the way people almost dying extras almost dying like I don't care about any yeah. of that like, you can blow up as many buildings as you want if you don't have the psychological tension behind all of those scenes then the movie does nothing for me and this does a great job like you don't know even like we were talking about with um, the FBI van. You don't know what Simon's motives are until an hour into the movie, and even then, that's a false. That's a false plot. Right. You're still not there yet, and so the idea of the scavenger hunt of having him move around the city doing all these different tasks with upped stakes is is really good. I love it. I love movies like this. Yeah, I'm just thinking. I, it's like Saw. The original Saw is kind of like the, like that. All the right? Saws. All I guess I've only seen the first. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I've seen them all, and I'm in for any time of <laughs> any type of puzzle solving, especially when you might lose like limbs or or have your head explode. It's even like uh, I have uh, Bruce Willis and Samuel Jackson together. Just like it's just like. It's just awesome. Like they're so they have such great chemistry. Like and you can just like it's feel fantastic. it. Yeah. Uh, I I mean kind of related to that. I just had you know Bruce Willis in a white beater. It's great to see that. And then <laughs> Samuel <laughs> Jackson with hair. Uh, it was just great to see him with hair. And, and the glasses. And the glasses. The glasses. Yeah. <laughs> it's like old His glasses are excellent. <laughs> um, I had the opening credits age really well for me. Like, we talk about the Harlem scene, but the way the movie starts, it's just, like, there's no fucking around. It's, like, die hard with a vengeance. Two beauty shots of New York skyline right down to hot down summer in the city, the song playing, and then a department store blows up. And you're just, like, you're in. Within, like, 45 seconds. Like, It's so good. It's fantastic opening. It really is. Uh, Fun fact about that scene, the blowing up scene, the truck that gets flipped over outside of what is it, Bonwit Teller? Teller's department store? Bonwit, the, I've never heard of it. Bonwit Teller, yeah. It went bankrupt in the 90s, um, but apparently it was like a big Fifth Avenue department store. Um, the truck outside of, and I just noticed this on like the last rewatch, the truck outside of the, the department store that gets flipped over is, Atlant- it says Atlantic Courier on the side, and Pacific Courier was the truck that Hans rode into Nakatomi Plaza in. Wow. So it's a That's little a callback to, yeah. It's a nice callback to Die Hard 1. It's a nice Wait, Easter so egg. W- where did that explosion actually take place? I know you said on Fifth Avenue, but like where? I think it's, the- I think it's Fifth and 56th Street. Okay. So where all those shops are there. Yeah. 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 Got it. <clears throat> um, I also have. Simon needed to, I needed to get your attention. I think Bruce Willis's hangover aids really well. I was hung up, I was hung over myself today when I watched it for the second time and I really felt this pain. Uh, there's just so it's not like it's like one line. They like keep going back to the hangover, like that he's hung over, yeah. like the whole fucking movie. Like there's so many quotes. You're fucking up a perfectly good hangover. Cut the shit. I've got a bad hangover. I've got a bad fucking hangover. Like it's just constant with the aspirin and then the aspirin playing a part in the movie like it was really like part of the movie it wasn't just like the aspirin is how he gets to the end and he wouldn't have ever asked for that if he didn't have the hangover the entire day it's really yeah. it's really good like it we, it's we've it, it makes sense for why the guy that has saved well he saved a building saved a lot of money from being stolen and saved a plane from crashing and a cuban general from getting released it makes sense as to why this guy can't solve any fucking puzzles to save his life. <laughs> yes. Uh, 
And then the last thing I wrote was the music, just the uh, when Johnny comes marching home, which is Great weird call. for an action movie to not have an original score. This is a song that's like goes dates back to the Civil War, I believe. Um, yeah, it's a Civil War song. So to have that like mixed in, and you also don't hear it until the 56 minute mark of the movie, and it's still that memorable. So when you don't really, until you see Simon, until you yeah. see, you don't see Simon until like 45 minutes in. And the song, like, so it's, the song is about soldiers coming home from war. And these are like Hungarian and East German soldiers who have just, like the Berlin Wall has just come down. They don't have a country. And so they're coming back from their fight. And it's also like, it's really menacing. Like, I don't. I can't think of another song, another theme in a movie that gets me like scared and amped at the same time. <laughs> other than yeah. like, other than um, what's the the one from the Social Network at the Henley Regatta, the um, the Mountain King. Yeah, that's a good one. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I mean, the dark. That's a good comparison. Great again. It's really well. Yeah. <clears throat> Do you guys have any other which is the best? That's that's it for me. I had a bunch there. I have uh, two others. Um, one I had is uh, just the use of the word inspector to describe a police chief. I, I wish that was a little bit more prevalent uh, today. I just love that word. Um, and Very I British. Did, I thought he played a great part, uh, Walter Cobb. Um, and then I thought those... Uh, I, I don't know what to call them. I, I called them silencer tranquilizer guns. Those guns where they just like, they're silencers, right, but they're yeah. like basically like shooting like a dart to like put somebody to sleep in them. But those are pretty cool. So Unanswerable question. Are they killing those people or are they just putting them to sleep? No, because he says he's not a monster. He's just a soldier. Oh, okay. All right. Oh, he's good putting them right? to sleep. And, yeah. and I think so. Me, especially when they go to rob the Federal Reserve. They make a point for somebody to catch the guy once he's down. You wouldn't catch him if you cared if he died. So you're, but you're, you're knocking out other soldiers for a period of time, but you're blowing up women shopping in a department store. <laughs> it, it's you look. You you try and you only do the casualties when they're necessary. Uh, yeah. How all many, right. Sending a message. A, what are the civilian messages that he, like that he kills? It's that first bombing. Well, I guess it's the subway so, bombing. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> That's it, though. Is that it? I guess so, yeah. I guess you're right. Yeah. I, I mean, they kill a lot of cops and security guards and, and like, they kill truck Walsh. drivers along the way. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Walsh, is, Walsh is dead. Is he the one they Who kill when they're going... Question. Who kills more people, John McClane or, or Simon Gruber? <laughs> we don't know how many people died in the, in the Teller bombing. Yeah, yeah, that's her, that's, her, that's, her, that's the unanswerable question because nobody yeah. died in the subway bombing, right? Because it went off outside of the uh, train. Uh, yeah, I think you know I, I could see some people dying from that. I don't know. Yeah. Do you have anything else, Andy? Um, yeah, uh, for age the best. Just considering some of the White House briefings that we're seeing, uh, the fact that everyone in the police department ignores the smart psychologist and just basically calls him an idiot. Like that's, <laughs> <laughs> that's aged pretty well considering where we are today. I had really this, annoying. The idea of the scavenger hunt is really good. I had when Johnny comes marching home, the idea of one of the, like the biggest chill moments in the movie is when they're trying to get the woman off the phone to answer the call for the going to St. Ives riddle. And they're trying to make up all these excuses. And Simon goes, you could simply say there's a fat woman on the phone and you needed to get her off. <laughs> so I, what's age the best is like the idea of the call coming from inside the house, I think is really cool. Like when it's been done, like I think when a stranger calls was the first one to do it. But it's been a constant theme throughout. Like Scream then did it in 98 or 99. Um, but it's just, it's really cool when you know that you're on the phone. You never think that anyone is, is looking at you at the, at the time. And Simon makes it abundantly clear that he's watching every move that they make. And it's another 
really good move in his plot to show that he's serious and knows exactly what they're doing all the time. Um, I also had when McLean's trying to tell Tech Cobb about the 21st president. This is in 1995. This is 25 years ago. And he loses reception and he just yells, goddamn fucking cell phones. <laughs> <laughs> Good call. That's a great I call. don't yeah. think that's going anywhere. Yeah. And I also had uh, people in New York. I think McTiernan got the New York atmosphere of bystanders really well. Because when the cop's pointing the gun at Zeus in the Wall Street station, people are still standing on the platform exactly where they were waiting for yeah. the train. <laughs> New York is going to happen around me. I'm going to stand here and continue on my day. And the Wall Street assholes eating popcorn and staring out of the window while the fire trucks come in and deal with the explosion. I feel like that would still happen today. Still totally. Totally. Yes. Yeah, look at that. So you mentioned the, uh, the, uh, the fat woman scream inside the phone call. That transitions me well to... Uh... What's age the worst? This was low down on my list, but I'll mention it now. I have fat woman shaming because mm. she's like, they, they show up and she's on the phone and you hear the other guy go, we got a problem. What? About 300 pounds. Uh, <laughs> Classic <laughs> joke. <man. laughs> and, and, then Sam, and then Zeus yells at her like, get off the phone, official police <laughs> business. And then when Simon Gruber says, like, you could have just said there was a fat woman on the phone and you needed a second. Like, you didn't have to say fat. You could have just said woman. Like, they really go out. And she's not even that fat. There's no way she's 300 pounds. And they really are making this poor woman feel terrible about herself, whoever that actress is. It's like, God, you know. So terrible. Really, 300 is really heavy. Uh, so we're on, we're on what's in the first now? Yes. Okay. In that, in that same light, in, we're in the 1990s. I also have uh, making fun of a guy with legitimate speech pathology. <laughs> Stutter. Yeah. 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 Don't you just we're, we're, kill me? Yeah. <laughs> That's not flying in 2020. Um, my number one, speaking of speech, what's age the worst is the accents. They're, and by and large, they're, they're just awful. Like, the German Wait, accents are bad. Um, they, they, they sound like the guys in Beer Fest being like, oh, but you can barely stand. Uh, <laughs> um, the New York accents are over the top. Like the secretary, the women cop are so over the top. Um, the kid on the bike is like, there's nobody here. There's no cops for 15 blocks. Uh, well, you don't, like, wait, you don't I think, think he's Connie, great. Connie, I think Connie, think you don't think great. Connie Kowalski's New York accent is subtle? <laughs> I do not. <laughs> you could um, steal City Hall. So the German, this is a, 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 some half-assing research, but it applies to the accents. The German spoken in this movie is all grammatically incorrect. A few lines are so wrong that they are considered complete gibberish, especially <laughs> the exchange of the fake cops once Zeus hands them the briefcase. The thing that they say outside the cab to each other is just German sounds, <laughs> not words whatsoever. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so when they actually dubbed this movie in German, they got it all right. But the way they differentiated it was they made the villains have East German accents and everybody else had West German accents. This makes sense to me because McTiernan is so fucking lazy with some of the stuff that he does in this movie. It's unfucking believable. All you need to do. I'm going to stop there because I got a lot of thoughts about how lazy McTiernan was. <laughs> For but you, you guys agree the accents are bad. The German accents are really bad. I was gonna especially I was, Jeremy Irons. Like he comes in and out if, of it all the time too. If you think about just all you have to do is think. McTiernan directed the first one, right? All you have to do is think back to Rickman's Bill Clay. Remember Bill Clay on the roof yeah. when he looked. His accent is unbelievable. It's so. I mean, it, no, it's it's extremely believable, and. A lot of people down here, mayor doesn't want to piss off, you know? Like, it's so bad. <laughs> a lot of money here. Wow, I, somebody I, had fun. Like, I'm doing a bad British accent, and yeah. it sounds better as an American accent than Jeremy Irons' American accent. I, I mean, I didn't yeah. think the, the accents were, like, accurate portrayal of how a German would speak English, but I, <laughs> I actually enjoyed enjoyed the accents for whatever that's worth. Like, I liked that Simon actually had a 
British accent, even though I guess he was really German. I, I don't know. <laughs> At least you can sound smarter when you have a British accent. You sound like a smart villain. I mean, it's classic '90s. It just like totally puts classic. the German on like yeah. a little thing. He, he like he'll throw in a "z" instead of a "the" in a sentence, and like consider that German. Like, could you pass the oranges? Like, you know, like <laughs> somebody. Yeah, there was also <laughs> one of one of the guys. One of the guys that does a a decent New York or, or a decent American accent. The cop that Zeus gives the bomb to. He's like, oh, we'll check up on that right away, and it's pretty good and then he calls simon and says in english he goes he's here and simon <laughs> yeah. goes but then the guy goes mclean is here <laughs> <laughs> you couldn't even get is right <laughs> also yeah, jeremy man. irons uh when he's pretending to be mr Vanderflug, which is a phenomenal name uh he goes, this is like, when he walks he, in the Federal Reserve? Yeah, yeah. He starts out Southern, then he gets a little foreign, and then he goes, like, back into British for a second. Like, <laughs> he's all over the map. And then, like, <laughs> thankfully, this, he just ends with him, with the guy getting the tranquilizer dart in the neck. <laughs> but, like, I don't know what he was trying to accomplish there. <laughs> Vanderflug is, Van is really bad. That's, my, that's one of my biggest nitpicks of the whole movie. Is that <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> Um, that, that's all I had for what's age of war. So whatever you guys have is, is good. Go for it. Mark. Uh, yeah, I, well, I have one, um, when the, uh, the switchboard lady is complaining to her boss and she's like, we're going to field all the calls from 911 and I'm going to marry Donald Trump. Oh, <laughs> like, that's I have like that. some I'm, dream. Yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I saw like, that. She could <laughs> marry Donald Trump. That's, that's really funny in retrospect. I had that as its own section. And then there's also uh, Hillary Clinton gets mentioned yeah, I was gonna when mention they're that, on the yeah. FDR. Uh, as the 43rd president. Which yeah. almost aged the best if she would have won as President 45. <laughs> like, that would have been incredible. Yeah, yeah but um, the exact opposite happens. So it's aged. No, I know. Yeah. <laughs> But yeah. the irony of, of a black receptionist saying, what am I going to marry Donald Trump? Like, <laughs> right. as something that would be a dream for her to do is, is phenomenal. Uh, Fantastic. Um, um, and then I, I have one more. Um, it's kind of a stupid one, but just $140 billion worth of gold is what they stole. I mean, I don't know if you guys have been following the news. We're, we're throwing around trillions of dollars like it's jump change like that's really not that much money in 2020 dollars so i just thought this kind of funny but it is an odd amount of gold to have in one oh chain. of course yeah of course yeah but, especially yeah. in individual lockers for each country, for each country there's yeah. no way in hell that's how it's organized all right we've got our south africa gold over <laughs> here uh, <laughs> so a yeah. couple of points on that i don't know if i don't know if that's necessarily not how it works um, so there's, this is, well, this is going into half-ass internet research. I'm going to step on this a little bit, but we're on it already. So in order to get that amount of money, what they said in gold out of the federal reserve, they had 14 dump trucks, right? Yeah. They would have needed, I have the actual number here. Wow. They would have needed 480 dump trucks to get that much <laughs> <Wow>. gold. Wow. <laughs> Great stats. Wow. And so Jonathan Hensley, Jonathan Hensley wrote the screenplay, and this is to go to like how the, the Federal Reserve is set up. So Jonathan Hensley's knowledge of the Federal Reserve and its inner workings was accurate and robust enough to have him detained by the FBI for questioning after the movie was released. He had to give up his source on how he knew about how this worked. And it actually was just it was like a low key New York Times article that no one read. That's amazing. Wow. That's really, really impressive. Wow. That's a lot of 480. Trucks. Jesus. 480 dump trucks. Do you have anything uh, else for what's age of the worst? I had the second Simon call where they, he meets Zeus. I feel like the, everyone's on separate landlines. I feel like, like that would have been like failed Zoom meeting today. Hey, <laughs> who just joined? Is everyone on? This is when they're at the police station. Yeah. yeah. No, but yeah. they pull Zeus over and they put him on a phone, right? That's true. Yeah. But nobody's on separate landlines today. Just the, the, the yeah, idea yeah, yeah, of separate yeah. landlines for everybody talking yeah. the same thing. Yes, that's true. Um, yeah. 
the the line when they're talking about Bond with Teller, this is like right at the beginning of the movie, where Joe Lambert goes, who would want to blow up a department store? And Connie Kowalski says, ever see a woman miss a, miss a shoe sale? <laughs> <laughs> that one's not flying at the So, like, that line is like, a, not there's a lot too. of lines in this movie that are classic 90s, where, like, the secretary's like, Inspector, you got to hear this. And he's like, no, you're really going to want to see this. Or like, you ain't seen nothing like this before. Like those action movie things where it's like they have like to make cheesy. their point. Yeah. 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 Um, no, trust me. You're really going to want to hear this. Uh, <laughs> Shots of the Twin Towers age poorly, obviously. And yeah, yeah. Uh, I've gone I've, in the last one. I had a couple of wardrobe issues. Simon's tank top is awful. Mm, yeah. That, like. That tight, it's too tight. No sleeve crop top deal. He's got what terrorist is wearing that thing these days? <laughs> Do you think yeah. he's doing it as an homage to McLean? Like I'm gonna wear a gray tank top. You wear the white tank top. Hmm. Interesting. Jeff Potts. Unanswerable question. Yeah. Sure. I like that. Sure. I'll buy that. <clears throat> All right. It's a. Uh... It's time for a new category called the director's chair. We'll talk a little bit about John McTiernan's personal life and how he got here. Um, so this guy came out in his career like swinging. He had one movie that no one's ever heard of, but then his second and third and fourth movies that he directed as a major motion picture director were Predator, Die Hard 1, and The Hunt for Red October, all within three years. Wow, in the that's incredible. That's phenomenal. Jesus. Like, what a run. Those are three epic, epic 80s action movies. Yeah. Um, then uh, arguably the best, the best three action movie run, consecutive action movie run in history. Pretty yeah. good as a director, yeah. And then he goes on, he does Last Action Hero, which I actually have a very soft spot in my heart for, uh, before doing this in 95. He doesn't do another movie after this until the Thomas Crown Affair in 99, which is one of my favorite movies of all time. And then his career goes off the rails. But let's just talk about that. Like Predator, Die Hard, Die Hard with a Vengeance, Hunt for Red October, Thomas Crown Affair. Like, wow. And he has, not made, a movie. He has not made a movie since 2002 for reasons I'll get into. But like, what a run. <laughs> Wait, I, I didn't know that. Jeez. <laughs> Wait, is Last Action Hero, that's Arnold Schwarzenegger and that kid? That's where he goes in the movie, he comes out of the movie. And, uh, yeah, 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 okay, yeah. That is a villain classic. is the guy from that Game long Charles time. Dance from Game of Thrones with the glass eye. He takes Jack the Ripper out, and they're like, it's, it's a very rewatchable movie for me. I saw what's it as a the, kid in the theater. It's what's terrible. The that's in it? What's the woman that's in it, though? Jamie Lee Curtis? Is that? Or am I... No, true, lies. Lies. A, it, true Lies. True Lies, yeah, that's, I'm sorry. Yeah, okay. Okay. Last Action Hero is not a good movie. Yeah, it's just no, I've seen it. I just can't think. It's awesomely yeah. bad. It's yeah, awesome. Yeah. It won like a bunch of Razzie awards, right? Like, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. got nominated or won best, like, like worst director of the year yeah. for Last Action Hero in like nine categories. The kids, the kid from My Girl Two, like, uh, it's it's, it's whatever. But it, no, My Girl Two. Oh, okay. Uh, sorry. So, so McTiernan is rolling along. He's throwing out hits. Makes the Thomas Crown Affair in 1999. Massive success. Then in 2002, he sets out to make this movie called Rollerball, which uh, I don't know if you remember this. I think this. I saw that. It yeah, I think I saw it. starred uh, LL Cool J, Chris Klein, Jean Reno, Rebecca Romaine. Um, I guess it was about – I never actually saw it. Um, but this is where he ends up getting in a whole bunch of trouble. So he was charged with hiring a PI to wiretap Charles Roven, who was the producer of Rollerball. Uh, apparently, McTiernan had disagreed over what the film should be. He was trying to catch Roven making negative statements about other executives at the studio. Um, he initially pled guilty as part of a plea deal. However, the prosecutors then became convinced he was lying and that he hired the same PI to wiretap other people which it turned out at the same time he was wiretapping this, he was wiretapping his third wife of the time as he was going yes. through a divorce. Um, <laughs> the judge characterized McTiernan as someone who thought he was above the law and lived a privileged life and simply wanted to continue that. 
Uh, this trial dragged on for years, appeals in and out of courts, plea deals off the table, back on the table, appeal, appeal, appeal. It didn't actually get settled. Um, 2008, he was finally ordered to surrender for incarceration, uh, but he was still out on bail. Another appeal, 2010, um, he gets sentenced to one year in prison and three years probation. The judge admonished him for never accepting responsibility for his actions after all these years. And he said he would have issued a worse sentence if the prosecution would have offered it. He didn't actually end up going to jail until 2013. So, wow. Rollerball, Rollerball came out in 2002. This guy yeah, finally gets all this settled in 2013, goes to jail, serves 12 months at a federal prison in Yankton, South Dakota, which is ranked by Forbes as one of the 10 cushiest prisons in America. Uh, <laughs> I just threw that in there because I thought it was funny that Forbes had a top 10 list of the cushiest <laughs> prisons in America. Forbes, um, Forbes magazine. What are you writing articles yeah. about? There? While in prison, he reportedly filed for bankruptcy and wrote a sequel to the Thomas Crown Affair, which has yet to be made. So oh, interesting. But after all these movies that we talk about, this guy let Rollerball derail oh. what was an amazing career. No, that's crazy. Rollerboard, terrible movie, but all those other movies that he directed are phenomenal. That's that's hard to believe. It's a great that's wild. Run. It's a it's okay. gonna be this is gonna happen in the who won the movie discussion, right? Because this is this revive well, it didn't revive it, but like he had a he had a bad run in between his three like his his diehard predator and what was the third one again? Well, Hunt for Red October. Hunt for Red October, yeah. Um, so you, you think he's still collecting checks from all these movies and some absolutely must be, right yeah okay yeah, so he's sure. just living in it, yeah. sure yeah. let me let me pull yeah. up what he did let me just also directed it, uh, basic also directed basic which is terrible but lots of pl- like people yeah that's the record for the most bad plot twists in a single movie right yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, so he did make basic after Rollerball, but Rollerball was the straw that, that got everything going. Um, so after Hunt for Red October, he made... Uh, sorry. After Hunt for Red October, though, in, which is 1990, he made Medicine Man with Sean Connery and Lorraine Bracco. Um, then he made Last Action Hero, and then the next one was Die Hard with a Vengeance. There's only two movies. Okay, but it was five. it was five years. I guess that's not that long in the grand scheme of things. And then he didn't make another movie from 95, Die Hard with a Vengeance, to 99, Thomas Crown Affair. What's he you doing gotta, for four years? It. You got to, th- well, he's, I don't know, earn, living off and, the royalties from Die Hard. And how you got to think sim- that being in prison and being a screenwriter, is it that, I mean, obviously you're in prison. <laughs> you could be worse jobs <laughs> that you could have. <laughs> You got a lot of time. Yeah. yeah. It's kind of ideal. It, it's like, what's, force what's, a be better, creative. what's a better job than being a screenwriter to have while in prison? Yeah. Well, he's actually only written one screenplay Chess that's Master. gotten made, and that was his first movie. He's only been a director. That's true. So, he also made a movie after the Thomas Crown Affair called The 13th Warrior with Antonio Banderas, which was a huge flop. No, from thanks. What I remember. Written okay. by Michael Crichton. Uh, so that's a director's <laughs> chair. Um, I don't, if you want to take this opportunity to talk about his directing style, I'm all for it. Now that we just debunked or de uh, or just deep dived his entire life. I mean, I, I feel like we touched on it a little bit. I feel like I love the way he shot a lot of these scenes. Um, like one that opening scene, just like we we talked about, not showing the, what's on the what's on Bruce Willis's body. That sign when he goes to Harlem. I don't know. Not too much CGI. I mean, he probably could have used more CGI in this movie, but I, I like that they didn't use too much. I don't know. I think McTiernan is really, he's really skilled at, at staging. Um, like we talked about this with um, the scene on the boat. He's really good at staging claustrophobic atmospheres while mm-hmm. not losing sight of the geography. Like you're talking about a submarine movie in, Red, in Hunt for Red October. You still you feel claustrophobic throughout that entire film, but don't feel it's not like a U five seven one situation where you don't understand where anything is. Um, Die Hard is the same thing. You he he calls back a lot of the same geography in Die Hard, 
with him running past that one that one poster of the of the naked woman um, through the vents. This movie has a lot of really good stuff on the boat. It has a lot of really good stuff um, inside of the tunnels where you under like and we can talk about the tunnel scene too, the damn scene where they blow it up. Um, I, have, this, I have some issues. I have some issues with that scene, but that's fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. But the, yeah. just the way that it's shot, like it, plotting and plotting is different than than the way it's shot. It, it's it's yeah. cool because understand you get the you, you get the the setup of that one truck going over that bridge, knocking knocking the knocking the plank off. Now they're stopped. Now they're stuck, and he does some good things there. I really like the way that um, that McTiernan uses the space of where those of where the actors are to depict this this sense of well we can talk about new york in a second but he does a it, one of his weaknesses is is research is <laughs> especially new york there's nothing that he does that really shows that he understands this town whatsoever except for maybe driving through central park and I'm going to leave it at that because we can get to picking this in a bit. Yeah. <laughs> I just think he does a really good job creating tension in all his movies. Like, yeah. The, the scenes with, with Arnold and the Predator waiting each other out are great. The scenes like with McLean, like stalking in Die Hard 1 and Die Hard 3, like just the, the slow burn of some of the action scenes are great. And then the payoff is like really intense and no CGI back then. So it's pretty like, like a lot of suspense. Like, yeah. Really impre- yeah. 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 Um, some casting what ifs uh, the role was written and offered Zeus Car- Carver to Lawrence Fishburne um, his agents turned it down for him at the time um, he also turned down the role of Jules Winfield in Pulp Fiction and his agents cited the fact that they didn't want him to be stuck in a supporting actor role for his entire career um, he tried to go back after he saw Pulp Fiction. He tried to go back <laughs> on his offer and get this role back. But by that point, the producers of Die Hard with a Vengeance has already seen Pulp Fiction and offered the role to Samuel L. Jackson. Um, wow. They were so impressed by him then. And since then, Fishburne, and I, I guess it was probably settled out of court, but Fishburne filed a lawsuit against the production company for going back on the verbal offer. Huh. I mean, it's I, a I feel like it, movie. Fishburne would, I mean, I think he could have played this part. He wouldn't have been as funny, I feel like. Um, I feel He's he pretty funny, did. though. Is he? Like, what, what is he in? Like, I, 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 watch, I, we watch the, I watch the show Blackish. Um, oh, okay. He plays, like, okay. the older yeah, grandfather yeah. who's, like, off his rocker. And, like, he's been in some of those other comedy movies, I think, too. He's, he can be really funny. But he's not. He's not. I mean, he's a phenomenal Jackson. actor. Yeah. Actor, though. I mean, yeah. Yeah, I don't think Fishburne has the I don't think Fishburne has the the confused comedic chops to pull this off. Yeah, like a lot a lot of what Jackson does is he just doesn't know what's going on and he's overwhelmed by everything and screaming as a defense mechanism and (laughs) it makes it so fun. Like (laughs) McLean, so good. And I do. There's there's no way there's no way that Fishburne. Flaps back at Willis with with as much intensity and comedic timing as, yeah. as Jack. There's no way that this works with Fish. Yeah. It's a different. It's not. It's, it's a different not movie. Yeah. yeah, it's not. It's it's way more cynical. It's way more serious. Yes, it's way more serious. It doesn't move as fast. Um, the other only casting what if I could find was that uh, the producers initially offered the role of Simon Gruber to Sean Connery who turned it down because he, quote, didn't want to be such a diabolical villain. Mm, interesting. I don't know how he would have pulled off the German accent with the Scottish twinge. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I Is think Sean he pulled Connery... off the American accent the same way that Jeremy Irons does. <laughs> <laughs> Is Sean Connery, I mean, I know he's been an actor forever, but is, is he not, like, a villain in any of his movies? Is that, like, a thing for him? Or I think, like, The Rock was one of the first times he played, like, someone who was supposed to be, like, quote-unquote bad. You yeah, know, but you like, end up loving him. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, I know. But, yeah. no, yeah, he's, not, he's not really yeah. a bad guy. Some guys, like, yeah. back then it was different. Like, you watch Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Like, you're either the the, right. the hero or the villain, and you get typecast in those roles. Now it's, like, 
we embrace the villains more than we used to, especially right. in the early nineties. Yeah. Right. Good call. Right. Yeah. Like look at Jean Reno. Like all he did in the nineties was play villains. Yeah. Um, that's a good point. Yeah. So Different era. that's, that's all I had. Um, half ass in his research. The original title of the movie was Simon says it was apparently written as both a die hard three or lethal weapon three. Just change the names, the story, and the characters a little bit, but it was like offered to both franchises. And apparently, I think it was more he wanted to be Lethal Weapon three, and they didn't want it. So then the Die Hard people bought it and made made it Die Hard with a Vengeance. But that's pretty where, crazy to think about. Where do you guys stand on the Lethal Weapons? Like, what are your guys' uh, thoughts, Jenna? I honestly just haven't seen that. I've seen them all a couple of times. I've probably yeah. seen the it's it's always sunny doing. It. Lethal Weapon 5 and 6 more than I've seen Lethal Weapons 1, 2, 3, and 4. Um, <laughs> yeah. I, mean, I, I, I was love, never a fan. I I can take a fan. I, they're great. I can take them or leave them. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not bringing them with me anywhere if I, if I have to take a movie collection somewhere. Yeah. 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 Um, Sam Jackson said that Zeus Carter is the... Is it Carver or Carter? I keep screwing this up. Carter. Carter. It's Carter. Carter. Yeah. Carter. Okay. Foreshadowing for Coach Carter. Coach Carver. That's why I have it written down as Carver so many times. Um, I'm like, no, it's Carver. Carver. It's Carver. It's Carver. And Carver. he's Coach Carter. And he's Coach Carter. Uh, okay. yeah. That's why I keep screwing this up. Uh, okay. He says that Zeus Carver is the closest character to my personality of any that I've ever played. Wow. Which is. It's kind of cool. Zeus Carver is a fucking amazing human being. <laughs> yes. Hey, that lecture he gives to those kids, that's phenomenal advice. I mean, it stands the white person thing part. Like, that's. Well, <laughs> or not, that's I don't know. I, mean, I think that might be the yeah. best part of, yeah. of his advice. Yeah. Right. yeah. Nephews. Yeah. Um, he also, like, if you look at, like, the evolution of Zeus Carver's character, too, is incredible because he he goes from not giving a fuck whatsoever. Another one of the, the quotes is, You're. You mean to tell me I'm in this shit because some white cop threw some white asshole's brother off a roof? <laughs> it's a great yeah, quote. Yeah, yeah. Really great That's quote. why he's here. Yeah. He goes Imagine from Lawrence that. Fishburne saying that. Like, yeah. Oh, <laughs> not it doesn't land. It doesn't he land. He goes from that. He goes from that, not caring at all, being completely apathetic, giving zero fucks, to all right. Now I'm going to solve these puzzles because there are other people's lives at stake. Think about this. To now, I know that my nephews are in Chester A. Arthur Elementary, and that's the the next thing that is consequential after that. After the realization is the bridge jump, where he backs McLean off and goes, "No, I'm going first. Yeah, right. yeah. Quick, quick uh, note on that: just uh, Chester A. Arthur uh, Union College graduate. Got to throw that in there. <laughs> nice. That's right. That's right. I went to college. <laughs> Uh, Donald Trump, Penn graduate. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, Sam Jackson said he got his look in the film from studying Malcolm X, so that explains the glasses and the and the, and like the clothes. It? I don't know why he uh -oh. was looking for Malcolm X for inspiration for this role, yeah. but I guess uh, maybe someone just clicked with him. But I like it. Um. Wait, Mike, we talked, about, we talked about Sean Connery being cast. I just thought the only way that this movie works better with Connery in the role is the meeting of Mr. Vanderflug doing a flower <laughs> business currency exchange at the Federal Reserve. That's the only role, that's the only part of this role that Connery pulls yeah. off better than Jeremy Irons. Maybe the sex scene, too. Uh... <laughs> I don't like that. <laughs> no. Um, uh, the chase scenes in the tunnel were filmed in NYC Water Tunnel Number Three, an unfinished aqueduct connecting the city to the Catskill Mountains. I don't know. It's kind of cool that that exists. That's very cool. Yeah, um, that's cool. Screenwriter Jonathan Hensley says the idea for the film came when he imagined what would happen if one of his childhood friends, who was injured after Hensley threw a rock at him, decided to seek revenge as him as an adult. Like what? <laughs> <laughs> That's sweet. I love that. <laughs> okay. um, figure. And this is the 
third of five films that Bruce Willis and Samuel L. Jackson have appeared together. Started with Loaded Weapon 1, speaking at least the weapon, the parody. They started in that. Then Pulp Fiction 94, this in 95. And then they did Unbreakable and Glass together. Um, so they've their chemistry is palpable, and it, it's gone on and stood the test of time. I actually love Unbreakable. I, I think that's a, a very good movie. I think it has its flaws, but I enjoy the entire trilogy of Unbreakable, Split, and Glass, which I have You saw Glass? Before. I did. I watched it on a plane. <laughs> <laughs> I you were really supposed like to see that. that. Mike, you and I were supposed to see that one in theaters, and it, it, it didn't end up happening. I really like Split, though. Um, whatever. <laughs> Moving on. Uh, you guys have any internet research that you found? That, that was the, the highlights for me. I got a couple. Um, McTiernan bought all the Mother, Bo- Mother Goose books for all of Simon's opening cryptic lines and riddles. Mm. He read through those when mm. he's helping uh, cool. Hensley with the screenplay. Uh, Jonathan Hensley, the screenwriter, based the uh, 72nd and Broadway to Wall Street station the drive through Central Park on a real life urge to go off roading in New York City to avoid New York traffic. <laughs> Which I also wanted to ask if you have to do that same drive at that same time of day in non COVID 19 times, McLean kills zero people. How many people do you kill or severely injure in your drive from at least? At least yeah, 20. Ten, yeah, 10 to 20. Yeah, I mean, Jesus. Oh, my God. Injuring, injuring. I'm not saying I mean, I'll, I'll slow injuring, down. Right, right, right. I'll yeah. slow down upon contact, but, like, there's a – my windshield is definitely getting splintered, and I'm doing the, the action movie push-off halfway through to, like, get it out of there. Uh, <laughs> You're taking out at least at least a couple of times. But yeah. the jump at the end is the most ridiculous part. I know I mentioned it, it earlier. Totally like, ridiculous. He, he jumps totally. those other line of cars by like a millimeter and then lands in the middle of Central Park South and then immediately turns on and is like, whoo, three minutes. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think he's getting over the city bike rack that's there now. No, yeah. no way. No way. No chance. Way too much sidewalk. Yeah. Uh, McLean expected to be dead in four minutes. When they said, we'll pick you up in 10 minutes, when they've got back up 10 blocks away, I expect to be dead in four. And this is the exact amount of time that passes between him wearing the sign and the guys on the porch seeing him and approaching him. That's pretty cool. Wow. That's, yeah. Very cool. And that's all I got. All right. Um, let's hand out some awards here. Uh, the Joey Pants, That Guy Award. This is a tough movie. Because, like, most of the other people in the movie are, like, completely nobodies. But uh, I went with uh, Officer Joe Lambert, the, uh, who's played by Graham Greene. He has Graham 162 act- acting credits. Uh, he generally plays the stereotypical Native American person in a lot of movies and TV shows. Um, he was most famous for Kicking Bird and Dancing with Wolves. Uh, but he, like, dials it up. Like, I would never know his name. Like... He has some great one-liners, especially in the first half of the movie. Like, where's McLean? I doubt you'll find him in church. Like, like <laughs> that's the first place they would look. Uh, really good 90s say, movie. movie yeah. Line. They stole 14 dump trucks in Staten Island last night. Yeah, it was probably John's landlady cleaning his apartment. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I had him, too. I- yeah, he's the that guy. He's the only that guy because he's the only one I've seen in other things. Everybody else in this movie I haven't seen in anything else. He's but the only I, that guy. Charlie I, makes an appearance in Road to Perdition as like a bouncer, but other yeah, than no, that. No. It's like, no. really, oh, wow. Well, I, <laughs> I, I, I swear, I, I, I looked at Graham Greene's IMDb. I, I, I've seen a Dance with Wolves, like a couple of them, but I don't remember him from any of them. But I swear I've seen him on like, a TNT commercial for some stupid Probably. movie or TV show. Yeah. And I just don't remember, you know, he's just Dude, that look, guy. Look at his, look at his credits. So I'm, I don't know if this is it, but he's been in like, he's always in like one episode of like Criminal Minds, one episode of Rizzoli and Isles, one episode of like <laughs> whatever. Like, he's just that guy. You, you have an Indian casino totally. in your, in your procedural that's in one episode. Who's your first call? In the casino. He's the casino. He's your first call. Grant, uh, you free? Honorable mention for that guy goes to one of the kids. Uh, Raymond is played by Aldous Hodge, who uh, grew up to be Voodoo on the Friday Night Lights TV show. 
He was in Hidden Figures, Black Mirror. He played MC Ren oh, straight out of Compton. Yeah. Um, he was Brian Which Banks he? in the movie Brian Banks. Uh, to get respect. Yeah, the little, the, the the younger one, the youngest kid in the first. The younger season. nephew. Oh, okay, the talk to Samuel Jackson. Okay. He's in that new Invisible Man movie with uh, Elizabeth Moss. So he's like kind of a big deal in Hollywood now. And he was just wow. a little, little kid in uh, That's pretty Die cool. Hard. So. Very cool. Honorable mention goes out to yeah. Alex Hodge, who is uh, also jacked and a very handsome man. Um, mm-hmm. Very good. The Vincent Hanna mm-hmm. They Knew Award. Uh, you mentioned him earlier in a good way, Mark. For me, it's Inspector Cobb, uh, played by Larry Brigman. I feel like his facial expressions alone are over the top. Like he's just like the exasperated New York city cop. Like everything is so like just over the top and outdone. Um, and I will explain this because this is pretty much his only big movie role. Otherwise he was in 1,160 episodes of as the world turns. So his soap <laughs> opera skills are on display. <laughs> Knowing that I was looking for them, especially like, he just has that soap opera looks like all the time, like the giant, like the bug eyes and like the, ugh. and just like everything is so over the top. <laughs> 1,160 episodes of As the World Turns. Oh my God. <laughs> you want to say through that while I'm acting in it. I didn't Jeez. have any others. Walter Cobb, like, really. I didn't have I, any actually, movie. I liked him in this movie. Maybe as the, as the overacting award? I, I, for me, it just his face. His face overacts for me. Like he just, it looks, it's yeah. too much for me. Like he feels like the calming presence of the movie, though. He's the guy that's like <laughs> that's asking John McClane how his kids are. We've got time to talk about the lottery, even though somebody blew up a department store ten minutes ago. We, he's given the speech to everyone after they tell everybody that you can't use your radios. We got to search all these schools. He's like. I don't think he's overdoing it that much. I can tell you who's overdoing it. Okay. Who do you got? My two nominees are um, what's Sam Phillips as Katya, yes. who I, is I it, have her, it's I have her only as well. and it's only there are two people in the same scene. She doesn't say a word, but she everything that she does is over the like. She's taking model style steps as an ex Hungarian militant, like the long three and a half foot steps <laughs> with the hip shakes. Everything that she does is going for it. But my my top nominee for the overacting award goes to the guard inside of the Federal Reserve who gets killed by Katya in that scene where he fires oh. 15 consecutive <laughs> shotgun rounds. He's freaking out. He's freaking out. While screaming. <laughs> He's totally yes. freaking out. <laughs> Dude, take a chill pill. Yeah. Katya's character, like, going back to her, too, like, she's mute because she has that giant scar on her, like, throat or whatever, Can right? you say a word in the right. entire movie? No, she's mute. I, I, um, I did not know that. I, yeah. Wow. And apparently this is her first acting role ever. Her name is Sam Phillips. She was a uh, contemporary Christian singer. And the casting director <laughs> noticed her on the cover of some album and put her in the fucking movie. Like, she's awful. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, and it's her, a weird part. Comes, I, do, I do enjoy when she comes out of the scene. Like, the knife skills, I guess, are kind of impressive at first. Like, and that's the first time you hear the music. But, like... She's so over the top with her facial expressions, too. And, like, yeah. yeah. I think he's dead, my dear. <laughs> I, I had, uh, I put Cargo for this, this award. I, yeah. I feel like all his faces are like, he's trying to be the big German scary guy. He's overdoing it. I don't know. He's trying to be this tall guy walking it. I don't know. I thought he overdid it, but it is a tough category. Are we, we might be confusing um, overacting with Dion Waiters. Yeah, I'm, I'm not giving cargo Dion Waiters, have, that's for sure. I have my, I have my Dion Waiters. Award. Sam, I have my. Uh, <laughs> let's right, just go let's there. Go. Wait, my so who wins, who wins they knew? Is it is it shotgun guy at the Federal Reserve? That's a good call. It's, a, it's an obscure call, because, so I'll agree yeah, with that. Yeah. It's too hard. It's too hard for this. It's a tough okay. um, my Dion Waiters is Charlie the Bomb Squad guy. Uh, 
he starts off, he sets off the explosion with a paper clip, like in the police station. Do you know how crazy you have to be to set off a bomb explosion in the fucking police plaza? Like, you don't do that to make a point. You can do that in a trash can. He can be like, here, guys, come over here in the sink. He just throws it into the fucking main room and lets the explosion Charlie, happen. I'm going to kill you. And he's just Charlie, like, you're going to be wearing the champions. <laughs> he's, he's so excited about bomb stuff, like, all the time. And just, like, the way he has that whole diffuser scene at the end. Somehow that white powder gets on his hands and it's all over his face. The sweat's dripping down. Like he's not, I don't even know if he knows what he's doing. Um, but I, all I wrote down in my notes was poor man's Philip Seymour Hoffman. <laughs> oh, shit. <laughs> Good call. I really love Charlie. He brings in every scene he's in he's and he makes his presence felt. I, I felt like he was like horny for the bomb like to like look at the bombs and like yes. try to defuse them like he got off on that like, let me take a look I'll, I'll go in <laughs> he's like the uh, the scientist in Independence Day who when the president shows up he's like <laughs> yeah. the last few days have yeah. been really exciting around here and he's like exciting <laughs> people are dying out there <laughs> for me That's I don't great. know there's no one else for me uh, oh actually I have an honorable mention uh Jerry, the truck driver, really brings it. Uh, I had him. I had him as my, my guy. So he gets the gun pointed at him, and he's like, are you a truck driver? And he's like, what do I look like, a beautician? Of course I'm a truck driver. <laughs> and then he, goes, he proceeds to like give the history lesson of all the tunnels and all these facts. He knows Chester A. Arthur. Like, he's just like just a great He's a great character. That guy. Yeah, yeah. So those are my two. I agree with those two. What do you got, Andy? Uh, I got... Uh, uh, Charlie is my, I think Charlie's my winner. He's on, he's on screen for like 10 minutes. He's one of the main drivers of the plot because he knows how severe this threat is. He's the only one that understands anything about the bomb, even though he knows very little. Like at the end of it, he's got children in the building and he's just on a wing and a prayer trying to defuse this bomb. Like, well, <laughs> it's going to go with the green one. Oh, goodness. <laughs> yeah. Pancake syrup. <laughs> He's great. He gets so ex- he get. I love the nerds in the in movies that get really excited, who get so focused on what their specialty is that they forget about the grand scheme of what it, the implications of what they're looking at are. He's yes. very cool stuff, and then he starts spouting off some nonsense about how they use this like negative feedback loop on the bomb in Lebanon, and Cobb's like, <laughs> "Shut up, Charlie." <laughs> Simon's on the phone. It's very yeah, cool it's, stuff. It's either it's either him or it's it's. I want to give an honorable mention to the combination of Katya and Targo as the number two in the Die Hard, um, because every Die Hard movie has a a solid number two villain, and in this one it just happens to be a combination of two people. Um, you've got Targo, who is clearly a fucking monster, who beats the fuck out of John McClane, like kicks him in the face and says. He said, don't shoot. <laughs> and then I don't understand the mechanics of that fight that they have. Like McLean pulls a, like the chain out that then takes Targo's legs out. And then after that, McLean has like beaten the shit out of him, but they cut away from it. He's not a solid number two villain, but Katya definitely is a solid number. Like the work that she does with that knife. I wish they would have brought the knife back out later on in the movie. Uh, yeah, that, was, that was dumb to never have it come up in a fight scene again. Right. It could have Why been done. Why did we show her off as this like ninja and then it yeah. never is used? Well, what else? Just what this... other fight scenes is she in? That's it. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. That's yeah. it. It's just yeah. to show like how, how like inherently evil she is. Yeah. That she'll continue to keep slashing this guy to death, even though he's clearly below her level in terms of combat abilities, having just fired <laughs> 15 consecutive shots of. <laughs> for what it's worth her form like with that samurai or, or with that knife fantastic yeah gorgeous yeah. so uh what you, you mentioned that chain scene with mclean and targo like we see mclean hit him with the chain and he seems to be down yeah why doesn't he kill him like he just like moves on and he cut I, away I, you're right and but do we assume else. he dies like i do we assume he got it i don't know that that was weird to me the only thing that I can think of is that this is the same thing. I mean, you saw this is the same thing with Carl in 
Die Hard 1, where he assumes that he's dead. But the assumption in Die Hard 1 is because Carl's hanging by his own, which is a good callback to the number two is death, having, involving a chain. Yeah. But I think maybe he thinks that he's dead and he can move on. There's also, there's also a bomb diffusing that needs to happen. So there's probably a question of time. Yeah. Unanswerable. Right. I don't know if Mark's peeing or getting a beer. I'm hearing some splashes of water. <laughs> grabbing a beer, <laughs> grabbing a beer. <laughs> uh, let's pick some nits. Uh, we've mentioned that we've picked a lot of nits as we've gone along. There's not we many have. that are on my list yet the the dump truck escape is just like just, just like, like i can i can buy most of the uh, uh the action scenes but that one is like a where did mclean learn to drive a truck like that b he like hops onto the roof of it while it's still moving and it goes straight for like a good 50 to 100 feet and then he jumps onto that grate but like it's and the CGI is it's terrible in that. It's, it's really bad. Uh, yeah. I'm just wondering how that truck stayed straight. You know, there's no shot of him, like, doing the, you know, putting the brick down on the, the wheel. Like, he just, like, pieces out and then hops onto the truck and then and then gets there. I don't know. Yeah. It, it, yeah. I agree. I agree on that, that one. That was really staged. I, think, I don't think that that scene ever should have happened, though. Because here's how it, here's how it goes down. Simon's got like 30 guys on the other side of the aqueduct. Targo gets pissed and is like, I'm going to go kill this motherfucker. Has six guys in dump trucks with machine guns with him. And Simon's like, no, I'm going to ease Targo's anxiety around McLean still being alive by saying, here, let's do a Bond villain plan and let's blow him up and drown him without actually seeing him dead. So like, <laughs> what's the better plan? So this is... But we have to think, like, this is all after Simon's plot was supposed to have already come to fruition because they were supposed to die at Yankee Stadium. Right. Yes. So Simon and Targo think that a better idea than sending nine guys with automatic weapons into a tunnel to kill one person isn't as good as let's blow the dam up with this bomb <laughs> that we have left over and hopefully he drowns. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you meant you mentioned Yankee Stadium. My picking nits is how the hell did did Zeus just walk right into the stadium? Totally. Yeah. On an off and, and, and that there's an assassin also set up to, to shoot somebody. Yeah. <laughs> how did those guys get that gun into the stadium? <laughs> Post it up. A luxury box. Four hours before game time. It's yeah. bizarre. Totally bizarre. <laughs> So question, were those were those two guys in the stadium because there's someone lining the field, right? Were those guys they got there like four hours before a night game? Cool, it's nineteen ninety-five. They let people in the stadium, whatever. Are those guys willing to go down for Simon's cause? Those two? Because you're gonna end up with a guy with a gunshot wound and there's three people in the stadium. You can limit your suspect list. <laughs> I don't yeah. know. Yeah. I don't know. That's a good question. Unanswerable question right there. Uh, uh, and I then my, yeah, sorry, my biggest one is just the end. Like, A, how did they get those trucks across the border? How did they get that warehouse? And then how do the, like, I get, I get McLean knows that they went to Montreal or Quebec. How the hell do they, like, pin that, the location down? We don't see any of that. It's almost like, they just like realize like shit. This movie's already too long. Like we gotta really just end this. Like wrap we just up. let's just get to Canada and wrap it up. Uh, yeah. Oh, we've done. We've no, done this is answer. Things. This is answer. No, I, the the aspirin pill I get. Okay, the hotel. It's it's, it's just the hotel, but they're in a warehouse, right? Uh, next yeah, is, that, to is the, that yeah? How do they know it's right next to it? Yeah, yeah. It's a leap. It's a leap for sure. And it's, it's a good cool thing, right? Yeah. I, they they really a, ended the movie. They just like realized they needed to end the movie. I feel like yeah, it's like no more riddles. Yeah. And and how far is it to take a chopper from New York to Quebec? Is that 
a quick. I don't think it'd be that far. It's an hour no? flight okay. to Toronto, so that okay. part doesn't bother me. Um, and okay. I kind of so think that there's not a whole lot of resistance when it comes to moving into Canadian airspace. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, so there was an alternate ending, which kind of explains, like, maybe why they just did this rushed ending. It does feel rushed. Uh, but the original ending was where Gruber gets away with it. And McLean mm. was used as a scapegoat for everything that went wrong. He's fired from the NYPD. And then the movie ends 20 years later um, with him tracking him down in Hungary at a bar. Um, and this version, Simon has double-crossed most of his accomplices by this point. He's gotten the loot to a safe hiding place somewhere in Hungary. He has the gold turned into mini statuettes of the Empire State Building to smuggle them out of the country. Um, and then McLean finds him and plays a game called McLean Says. And they go through this whole <laughs> form of Russian brunette with a small Chinese rocket launcher that has the sights removed, meaning it's impossible to determine which end is which. I, it sounds very ridiculous. Um, and another like hour of the movie. That's so, like another um, movie. Yeah. That's, yeah. But they, they shot Jesus. it. So, um, wow. it ends up I with. I oh, watched it. I watched, it? That, last, I watched it that last thing. They filmed it. Um, you only you only see the when they when he sits down inside of Simon's, I guess now villain lair, and with the Chinese rocket launcher, and it's McLean asking Simon esque questions to Simon, who's unprepared for them, <laughs> and it's I think they stole the whole thing from the Vicini uh, move with the black men in black from the Princess Bride with the wine glasses. Yeah. Where he okay. him around. Yeah. And I guess McLean's wearing a flak jacket and Simon ends up blowing himself up. It's I'll take this ending over that one. It's yeah. dark. The other one's darker and weirder. It, it doesn't work. I don't think it works at all. Yeah. <clears throat> That's it for me on picking nits. I mean, we, we we touched on a lot of them. It's an action movie, so I don't like to go crazy. But uh my yeah, last gotta... we, we talked about New York. Oh, go ahead, Mark. I got a few others. They're they're small, so I'll just kind of go through them quickly. Simon uh, calls into the Elvis Duran radio show. He just gets right in. I don't know how he gets right into the radio show, but he's on the air right away. That was really also, neat. Elvis Duran was on in the morning, which is a nitpick if you want to <laughs> go that far. <laughs> That's a nice. Good call. Elvis Duran in the Z Morning Zoo, right? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Uh, in Tompkins Square Park, where they did the jug thing, the briefcase with the bomb is just kind of sitting there on the water fountain. Nobody grabs it, just sitting there. Nobody kind of in Tompkins Square Park, where you have a kind of a lot of you mean, people. You mean before before they get there? Yeah, before they get there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Someone easily could just blown and, themselves up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nobody yeah. picks it up and looks at it. Uh, I mean, why Simon doesn't kill Bruce or uh, Samuel Jackson? He has. A multitude of opportunities to do that, right? And then, yeah, like, I mean that's that's Bond. I know, I know, I know. I'm, I'm nitpicking. I'm nitpicking. <laughs> he wants to torture him. <laughs> uh, and then the last one, again, this is just nitpicking the way the movie's gone. But in the aqueduct, when Bruce is talking to Jerry, the truck driver, and he's like, "Go find the inspector." In a city total of total chaos right now. About <laughs> ten minutes later, Jerry finds the inspector. He's like, "I was told to find." <laughs> what the hell? Yeah. There's no chance he finds the inspector within ten he minutes. Also, he also never told Jerry to not use police and FBI frequencies. <laughs> like, just, just go find him. Oh, by yeah. the way, if you try to use the police frequency, the bomb's gonna blow up. <laughs> which is another one I, of my nitpicks if so simon in the in the fbi van scene says the dan the darn things seem to respond to police and fbi frequencies are there not cops on police and fbi frequencies all over the city at that moment like there's other crimes <laughs> right. going on Every, everybody yeah. if anyone was smart enough to figure this out that bomb would have blown up a thousand times over before yeah. they even figured the <laughs> Yeah. Before Simon even told anybody. But there was no bomb. Exactly. Yeah. 
But yeah. someone should have figured this out and been like, wait a minute, it should have already gone off, and therefore he's bluffing right off the bat. Yeah. yeah. Um, that, McLean, that's the genius of setting off two bombs already in the city, people. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You've established credibility, which is why the the man to St. Ives, the bomb in, in the department store, and mm -hmm. the bomb in the Wall Street station are so brilliant because it establishes that he knows everything and he's willing to do whatever it takes to get his, to get his plot through. Um, why isn't the federal, why is the Federal Reserve still taking appointments from power? <laughs> Industry salesman <laughs> when the seismic alarm to Martin Yeah, that's great a question. Big problem. Yeah, uh, I got no answer for you there. That's, that's a bad, that's that's phenomenal. A bad twist. Or after a subway just exploded three blocks away. <laughs> uh, Dear God, if anyone knew. Uh, yeah, that's bad. Um. Cobb says that they've got three hours and 15 minutes to, to find this bomb. So the, the FBI call ends at 11.45. Simon sends McLean and Zeus to Tompkins Square Park from Wall Street Station. He says, 20 minutes, no rush. I, I looked at this. Go, go by foot. Go, go by foot. Go by foot. It's 2.3 miles in 18 minutes. That's a 7.45 pace. They're not. For, they're run, They're hoofing it though. They are hoofing it. For a 50-year-old electrician, <laughs> a hungover as balls cop. I'm just saying the geography is a little off. But my question is, which one of us has the most has the best chance of not getting there before the bomb explodes? Wait, Andy, you're saying it's uh, a walking time is yeah, two point four miles. You're right. Okay, it's it says forty nine minutes. minutes. Yeah, 50 it's fifty minutes, minutes of walking time, but it's a seven forty five mile for two point three miles. Mark, I think Mark could make it there. Well, Mark could make it. Obviously, we know that Mark could make it. Mike, which one of us? Twenty five year old me has, has, has the best chance of, of making it. No, I mean, I, I don't think I could do that right now. I, I, I honestly I don't know who I'm betting on. <laughs> <laughs> We're a month into quarantine. There's no way I'm making it. 7:45 for two hundred <laughs> miles. Mark, could you yeah. do that? Uh, yeah, I think I could do 7:45 for two. Do miles. you think John McClain and Zeus Carver could do it? No chance. No chance. <laughs> he also said, no <laughs> rush. Go by foot. No rush. No, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> um, no way they survived the blo the boat explosion. No, no chance. Not a chance. Uh, and I like that the Canadian police, like maybe like 40 cop cars, all of a sudden just completely negate the firepower that the entire East German army in that warehouse <laughs> has. Like the cops, <laughs> are up and, oh, the movie's over. Like, they'd they, probably get into it at that point with 480 <laughs> dump trucks worth of gold at stake. They needed to wrap it up. They needed to wrap it up. And I think the one person that we didn't talk about was Otto. Who's Otto? The guy that the doesn't guy who speak... doesn't speak English. Yeah. <laughs> the guy that doesn't speak English that they brought in to oh be right right to Walsh at the beginning when they're all introducing <laughs> themselves in English. We said don't shoot. <laughs> yeah. Otto doesn't speak English, do you, Otto? Why do they bring this guy with him? <laughs> well, he's he... good muscle. He's good muscle. <laughs> he's not good. He's holding the gun to McLean in the, in the elevator scene with the with the lottery ticket bat. Uh, he's holding the gun to McLean's chest for thirty seconds after McLean has shot two people, and he's saying, "Don't shoot! Don't shoot! Don't shoot!" <laughs> And only after McLean moves the gun away does he start emptying his clip. Like this is he's the wor the recruitment job on Simon's part is a little suspect. That's bad. I agree. Yeah. yeah, that's fair. I, I agree with that one. Uh, I also was wondering why do they lock the school doors 
like when they're going through the school like why do they actually lock them like what's the point of that <laughs> <laughs> like why are you taking the chance that tests uh, Smart. maybe there's some like selling tests it's, in there it's so that dumb. get stolen uh... <laughs> when he yeah, closes right. down the school they, they literally lock every single door <laughs> like somebody might break in or something this is weird that's definitely what they do at schools though right like no i know like at went... the end of the day <laughs> Yeah, yeah. But this is an evacuation here. It's like, yeah. All right. That's a good point. It's weird. That's it's weird. really good. That's really good. Um, <laughs> recasting couch is a little tough. Uh, I would have liked to just personally see a, a hotter woman who spoke words. If I actually got nude. Uh, <laughs> I don't know who I would have suggested because you don't want someone who's going to steal the movie, just someone who maybe speaks. Um, and has a personality that I've seen before, but wow, um, that's a that's a hot take. <laughs> Connie Kowalski, what Connie Kowalski wasn't doing it for you? <laughs> no, I'm fine with her being in the movie. Is this movie better or I'm worse with re- Connie? I'm saying re- recast Katya is the only role I would have recast. Oh, oh, Kat- Katya, Katya. Okay, sorry, I missed that. My bad. <clears throat> So I would have, uh, I was thinking, I mean, I love Jeremy Irons as a villain, but I was thinking just in terms of that time, like I thought Anthony Hopkins would have been an interesting villain in this movie or uh, John Malkovich would have been interesting. In that role. So that was the only two. But yeah, I, I think all the other Malkovich. parts you can't recast. Malkovich is a good call. I don't know. I don't know how big he was at the time when this movie was yeah, made. Yeah, I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah. It's interesting. I don't think there's any better villain voice than than Jeremy, Jeremy Irons. Irons. I, I think like, Anthony Hopkins has like a great voice. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Be but interesting Jeremy Irons is star yeah. in The Lion King. Like he's just like he's yeah. got that 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 thing. Yeah. Now. Like yeah. But, so you got to remember that um, Silence of the Lambs came out two years before, right? And right. well, then the Lion King, came, but the Lion King came out the year before this, right? So you've got two years, two years, two, yeah. of, the, two of the two great movie villains, two great movie villain voices back to back, and then you repeat one of them. I don't know. I just don't see Anthony Hopkins doing a whole lot of tank top wearing. <laughs> Definitely not. Yeah, he would have to have like a, a blazer for the on East for sure. Army. Yeah. <laughs> I had a, I had two Jeremy Irons notes that I, just random notes that I wanted to get to. When they get to the boat, when McLean uh, interrupts him, he's just eating a hard-boiled egg, which I find very funny. Because you don't see anyone else eat food the entire movie. The only piece of food that's eaten this entire movie is this disgusting, warm, hard-boiled egg that he's probably been like hoarding the entire day. Um, that's a great fact, <laughs> and then he I want to I want to weave this into a, a later question. He uses the term communique very nicely for like a good five minute stretch where he, he <laughs> drops communique like five times in a in a five minute stretch like <laughs> no one says communique this is a communique from simon Gruber of the hsc whatever they are uh, that's, that's good that's it that's really great yeah. <laughs> but let's go do some unanswerable questions since you just uh, referenced it that was next anyway so proceed with your egg question well the it, it revolves around the egg qu- but my my first question was unanswerable question was better evil plot hans gruber or simon gruber simon hmm. he actually like thought out riddle yeah i feel like that's more diabolical simon it, it takes a lot more planning and I don't know. What do you What do you think, Andy? I mean, it's it's a way better it's a way better Simon's got a way better plot, and yeah. it goes it goes all the way into we need to make sure that we've got a salt and pepper shaker on the deck of the ship that we're gonna eventually end up fake blowing the gold up so that I can put salt <laughs> on my hard boiled egg <laughs> when it's <this is> all over. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I, I thought that of... would yield a lot more discussion than it actually did. So right. no, I, I think uh, yeah. I think it's one hundred percent Simon. This movie for Simon, me, this movie's yeah. better in like every respect. From like yeah. my personal point of view, yeah. 
I, I haven't seen the original ah. Die Hard in so long, so I, I feel like I can't ad- adequately answer that. Um, I, I have a it, couple it other. Does, it does what a lot of sequels do. Is it? It takes. It does what good yeah. sequels. Do. Is it takes yeah. everything from the original movie and amplifies it, and the idea that we so we figure out what Hans Gruber is up to, even though I think he's still one of the top six or seven movie villains of all time, and Simon is only like riding the coattails of Alan Rickman's performance. But you find out what Hans Gruber is up to like thirty minutes into the movie in the first Nakatomi boardroom meeting with joseph takagi right like you you know that it's a heist you know that it's a heist right off the bat and that his act is faking through the dumb cops and dumb fbi agents throughout this one you don't know that that's happening until an hour into the movie and you've got all these different steps and all these logistics even though the logistics of it are ridiculous totally ridiculous yeah what happens if the claim gets killed in harlem (laughs) <laughs> I, which yeah, yeah, I don't by know. the way was well on the way to happening before <laughs> then he would have just put a in the other cops the the riddles, Samaritan right? shows up what Mike? he would have just put the other cops through the riddles I don't know I, the, the key for Simon is really just saying that there's mm-hmm. a bomb in this school right? I feel like that distracts everybody there's no yeah. schools downtown that diverts every police officer uptown but you still, really need, his, you still need to exp- you need you still need to blow up the bomb in Wall Street. That's the key to it, right? That's true too. Yeah, that's true too. Yeah. Yep. He yeah. knew that he knew that McLean's gonna make it out of Harlem. Come on. Because he Could, killed his brother. And he also didn't care. Like if he would if he wanted him to die in Harlem, he would have like made sure he died. Whereas he kind of like wanted him to just like be rattled a little bit. Yeah, so we assume we we assume that Simon also knew that McLean would be hung over, and this is just a, a shitty way to start his day. Yeah, <laughs> rubbing hey, it. Hey, Andy, we we gotta go grocery shopping at eight o'clock in the morning. All right, fuck, <laughs> yeah. too much. Okay, um, I have one. Why did he give him the aspirin bottle? So I. I... I relate to that. I feel like they were both taking pills back and forth. I didn't know if there was some sort of foreshadowing to each of them uh-huh. taking pills. I, I don't know if uh, the director was thinking about that. Uh, yeah, I, it's an unanswerable question. Simon, Simon took a, uh, unhealthy doses of aspirin that day. He was pounding. So he took a lot of them. Did McLean take any? I mean, he took maybe one or two? or I don't know. Uh, I thought there was like a deeper meaning to that. No, yeah, I, I couldn't think figure he, it out. He, he was asking for him all day long. He finally got him. The so question, it, though. The question is, why did McLean ask for aspirin knowing that he was handcuffed and couldn't possibly have any way <laughs> to take the aspirin? <laughs> so, great toss. Like, great yeah. toss. <laughs> a flight of stairs <laughs> lands it right in his nutsack. Yeah, that's pretty good. Trouble. Yeah, <laughs> that's somebody who knows how to like kind of play something. So you you know you can't catch it with your hands, but he'll place it in the right spot so it doesn't drop. That was, that was well done. Yeah, I uh, think that if, if I were if we're going back to a different version of the director's chair where I get to remake the movie by myself, <laughs> I would have I would have had Simon give McLean the aspirin while he's laying down on the deck before he ties them up to the bomb. Mm. I would have had that be the last interaction that they had. I would yeah, have had yeah. it come earlier and have him actually take the aspirin and keep the bottle. I do like how McLean calls them aspirins, though, plural. Which is like a nice <laughs> touch. It is a nice <laughs> New York touch. <laughs> you have <the> uh, <laughs> I had, uh, as another one for, for unanswerable question, um, is Lieutenant McLean the best action movie driver ever? And I was trying to think of the list that would be on that. But I thought he was phenomenal driving the taxi through Central Park. He, you know, he's driving on FDR. Yeah, if you want to stuff. exclude the Fast and the Furious franchise. We well, I, I put that, that, the yeah. Fast and the Furious people uh, on the list. I put Ryan Gosling in Drive. There's another one that came. The kid from Baby Driver. 
if you want to go he's Sandra not, Bullock he's and He's not speed. a better driver than Don Toretto. I'm telling you that right now. Uh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> but this is a, no, Mark, it's a, it's a good, it's a good segue into John McClane being the best nobody average guy to then be good at things under pressure. Yeah, like the Fast and the Furious people, they specialize in driving, clearly. Like, They're all professional. Just, right? yeah. John, that's, that's, is yeah. the New York cop. Like, John McClane is not the greatest terrorist killer in the history of action movies. There are CIA yeah. guys who are, like, trained killers throughout <laughs> all of movie history that are better at this than John McClane. But, yeah, yeah in a pinch. <laughs> the way he drives the truck is way more bothersome, bothersome to me for some reason than him driving the cab. Because you feel like as a cop, he probably came up, had plenty of experience driving the police car. But, like, he wheels that truck around on a dime. Like that, right. is an, yeah. like that is a really hard maneuver. A dump truck. Yeah. <laughs> There's no way he's driven a dump truck before. Why does Zeus have in the same why does Zeus have that one tool that is the universal car starter tool? Yeah, it was the nineties. It was really easy. <laughs> yeah. It was really easy to, to start. Trish, start. You know, hot wire. Yeah, but it takes takes two fucking long. Uh, yeah. I, don't, I have some yeah. others, but Andy, Andy, I don't know if you want to go and no, 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 answer Mark, more questions. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. Uh, I was wondering if this is the best third movie in a trilogy. Um, I know there's ob- obviously subsequent movies to this, but this is, mm. I think, one of the best third movies. The, the other ones I was thinking of was Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. I thought that was a phenomenal mm-hmm. topper. Um, it's great. If we're talking about switching roles, is sh- is uh, Jeremy Irons a better father to Harrison Ford than Sean Connery. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that was a good one. <laughs> that movie is fucking terrible. <laughs> uh. <laughs> yeah, I mean, Return of the Jedi, Last Crusade are like yeah. cappers, whereas this yeah. is not. Although yeah, it was probably are... meant to be a capper. Um, they didn't think they were going to make one for 12 it. years. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Mike, you're with the Skywalker up there? No. <laughs> Pretty good. It's good, though. Uh, not it's better fun. than Die Hard with a Vengeance. Uh, no. And then the last question I'd love to answer, and it's obviously unanswerable, is just what was the damage in New York City in terms of cost done that day for the whole movie? I mean, you think about all the bombings, the everything that got screwed up. It, I just can't imagine. Like, all I was thinking was, like, Jesus Christ, this is going to cost a ton. To fix and repair and, and all that. And why did the one police sergeant get get complete jurisdiction over whom he let into the damage site <laughs> without <laughs> any sort of confirmation whatsoever? It's bizarre. Totally oh, bizarre. Yeah. You guys look okay. You speak with <laughs> acceptable yeah. American accents. Yeah. Yeah, come on in. Yeah. On. It's a lot. Yeah. Yeah. It's a lot. It's billions, I think. What do you got, Andy? The bomb and the bomb on Wall Street is unbelievable. It shuts the uh, whole yeah. area down. Subway, yeah. yeah. It shuts I mean, the stock market down, but not the Federal Reserve. They're still taking appointments. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty sure the market goes on pause for the long weekend yeah. if that if a bomb goes off in the two three stage. <laughs> They're still accepting appointments from foreign flower distributors. Yeah. <laughs> also, that guy's name, the, the, the character name that accepts that appointment's name is Felix Little. Is there a better nerd oh, name? Wow. That's pretty good. That's perfect. Uh, unanswerable questions. I had... What's Zeus's plan for the rest of the day if he doesn't have to deal with John McClane. We don't yeah, know I mean, if, what his situation is. We don't know if he's yeah, married. I assume, no. Yeah, we don't know. I assume he's running his store. I don't know. Yeah, but probably one of those guys days. who stays in his store like 18, 16 hours a day, you know? Yeah. yeah. That's his store. That's, that's unanswerable, though. Yeah. That's all I had. We already answered all my unanswerables. Yeah. Um, I had a couple of I had a couple of different categories that I wanted to, or just one category that I wanted to talk about, which is definitely an answerable question. But I wanted to go 
Die Hard 1 versus Die Hard 3. Cast, casting role, like typecasting role versus typecasting role. So who wins for you? The hero in Die Hard 1 versus the hero in Die Hard 3. So we're going McLean versus McLean. Where do we get um, a better Who's a better McLean? The non hungover one. It's yeah, Die Hard. Die Hard one. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Yeah. The better number two. Sergeant Al Powell or Zeus Carter? Zeus. Zeus. You just Zeus. you love Reginald Val Johnson, so it's hard for you to look at I this love, rationally. I love the I love me some, I love me Carl some Johnson. I love me. Some, he's still the background on my phone. A uh, better villain, Hans versus Simon. I, we touched on. I, I I I like Simon better. I, I just feel like he's more diabolical. But I think the arguments you can make for the other side too. I, I pick Simon because Alan Rickman, like like the, the latter part of his career, wasn't as a villain focused. Whereas Jeremy no, Irons is these two movies. Just these two. No, movies. I know. But I'm saying as okay. as I look at them now, as I can't watch the the two actors now. Like Jeremy Irons is just the villain, right? He's always the villain. It's like what he specializes in, probably because it started with like this movie in The Lion King. And he's just really good at playing a bad guy. So, but we're talking like, about actual villain. We're talking about no, we're not talking about Alan Rickman versus Jeremy yeah, Irons. Yeah, yeah, I know. Hans Gruber versus Simon Gruber. Simon's still better. He's had more time to to plot this out and plan his revenge. I think. The younger brother's always better. In movies. Says the guy that's got a multitude of older brothers. <laughs> <laughs> nice. All right. Uh, the evil number two. Carl versus the combo of Targo and Katya. I think I can go Carl. Yeah, Carl's hair alone. <laughs> I hate I hate Katya. She sucks. Yeah. Uh, she didn't get enough knife time. No. If they showed her more doing yeah samurai knife stuff, it could have been more. She's got a really good career in the American farming industry. <laughs> yes. <clears throat> uh, the cops in Die Hard One. Versus the cops in Die Hard 2. Or Die Hard 3, sorry. Mm. It's just like overall. I guess Die Hard 1, they're better. The New York cops are terrible. What? They're not, they don't, they're not good at this at all. They complete. what are they bad at? They don't defuse the school bomb in time. They don't stop. They actually don't stop anything. If you think about it. But they at least. McLean does. Okay. But we can think about. All right. So let's let's think about the the cops in the first movie versus the cops in the second in the third. Right. You've got. Who's the who's the sergeant in the first movie? The guy who, who is it? Oh, yeah, Paul Gleason, Dwayne T. Robinson. I love that he, guy. He's the guy at the helm. Did he do anything right in the first movie? I don't know, but he's the, pre- he's the principal from The Breakfast Club, so I feel like he's more of an authoritative <laughs> figure than, than cop. <laughs> Walter Cobb, I, I don't know why, why can we can you guys tell me like why you guys are down on Walter Cobb as Whoa. the police chief? I, I love I just, Walter Cobb as inspector. I, I, I just for, think for the record. Like, like I, I think for me I get caught up sometimes like looking at their acting careers and I'm like, why was he never in anything ever again and why was he never in anything before this? Uh, we're talking strictly about characters. Yeah. We're yeah, he's characters. phenomenal in this role. I, I agree, Andy. I guess he does a good job. You're right, he does a good job. He's great. <clears throat> um, the FBI guys in the first movie versus the FBI guys in the third movie. 
I think the first movie, right? I mean, the the ones in this movie do literally nothing. Yeah, they're other than just present, present the information. But <laughs> I, I don't Mark, even know. <laughs> Mark, what do you got? Yeah, he said movie, first. Right? He said first. Yeah, yeah. So I, have, I think that the FBI guys in the third movie do literally nothing. They tell you who the villains are, and that's it. And the villain knows exactly what it is that they're doing. The FBI guys in the first movie not only do nothing, but every move that they make advances the plot of the villain. Yes. Ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> I give you, they, they shut the power down, which opens the vault. They're cocky as fuck. They get killed at the end and also lead to the greatest line in the history of all diehard movies, which is after the roof blows and the helicopter blows up. Um, the police, Gleason goes, we're going to need some more FBI guys, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, should we go to best quotes now? <laughs> yeah, that was that's all. <laughs> well, I'm just playing off best quotes. Uh, the FBI didn't need to be in this movie. You could have cut that scene out and just had the New York people do it. It was it's only a good, good scene, but they, they don't need because them because he calls out the guys and tells them what they are. But you, it was inconsequential in the end of the day. Yeah, it was cool that the New York guys didn't know anything about the LA thing because everyone in yeah. New York is so New York centric. It was cool that they had yeah. no fuck who was going on. Yeah. yeah, yeah. We we talked about most of the best quotes. The only other ones we haven't mentioned. I think my favorite one is still Zeus saying what his name is. Like I don't think anything's getting better than that. Uh, but I do like do it. Right, Do it. right before that, he says, you're trying to relate to me? Talk white. Uh, <laughs> Talk like a white man. I like when uh, Bruce Willis says to, when he's on the, when he first takes over the uh, dump truck, he says, Niels is dead, you fuckhead. I just really like fuckhead. But he like said that a couple like times. The first times, like he invented fuckhead, and it's a great <laughs> term. Uh, can I, I can finish stick- it? Can I finish yes. it? Yeah. Attention, Nils is dead. I re- <laughs> Nils is dead, fuckhead. So is his pal and those four guys from the East German All Stars. Your boys down at the bank, they're going to be a little late. Yeah, that, that's good. when he's in the chopper, right? He, he's no, no, that's when he's in the dump no, truck. He's driving oh, the, the dump truck. truck. Oh, okay, okay, right, right, right. Nils right. is dead, fuckhead is incredible. Yeah. yeah. It's been uh, you can stick your well-laid plans up your well-laid ass is the only other Samuel L. one we didn't mention. But that's a great one. That's a good one. <laughs> he hangs up the phone, and the cops are like, what are you doing? <laughs> and McLean is <laughs> laughing into the phone. Yeah. And that was a good one. Yeah. <clears throat> Mark? Uh, I had... When, I had one obscure one and one more mainstream. One when, uh, when Bruce Willis... Uh, commandeers the BMW from that rich guy, and he just like as he's like taking his car, he's like, yeah. "Who is the twenty first president?" He's like, "Go fuck yourself." <laughs> 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 and then uh, the other one I had was when the police captain's like, "I got a detective that's two steps away from a full blown alcoholic." And uh, John McClane mimics him like, "One step away, one step away, <laughs> one step away." <laughs> Uh, those are my two. Oh, that's good. I had to go fuck yourself after the music. <laughs> it's really fun. Um, I thought there's a difference, you know, between not liking one's brother, not caring when some dumb Irish flatfoot drops him out of a window. That one's good. Um, also, when they're talking about, I don't necessarily. Remember, oh, he was talking about the 21st president to right before his cell phone goes out. He goes, have you been drinking, McLean? He goes, no, not since this morning. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. You mean to tell me I'm in this shit because some white cop threw some white asshole's brother off a roof? So That's good. a great quote. That's a great quote. Samuel L. Zeus introducing him to Father of Apollo, Mount Olympus. Don't fuck with me or I'll shove a lightning bolt up your ass, Zeus. <laughs> and so good. One That's of my favorite. favorites. One of my favorites just like in setting how serious this bomb and the threat of it is, is Charlie in that first scene where he says, well, once it's mixed, be somewhere else. 
<laughs> I think. Yeah, yeah, he's getting off on that. Yep. <laughs> Loving it. Fucking Charlie. I love the way the inspector says Charlie. Charlie! <laughs> <laughs> Damn it, Charlie. Last uh, time it takes the kids a minute and 15 to get out of the school. <laughs> Last time I checked, you're not too <laughs> light on your feet, Charlie. I can do this. Uh, uh, that's good. That's good. Are we uh, ready to top this Ape- off? No, no. Apex Mountain, quick. Oh. Uh, Charlie, definitely. Uh, <laughs> Apex Mountain. Uh, I think just McTiernan is the only one. I think it's obviously his Apex Mountain. Uh, he, he's... <laughs> Cut. He's totally. like they, they reaching the crescendo, and then right before he makes Thomas Crown, and he almost had the power to make anything he ever wanted, and he threw it all away. Um, it's not Bruce. It's not Jackson. It's not Irons. I don't think. Um, See, you you don't put Bruce. I, I, I was just Jeremy kind of looking. Irons, Jeremy Irons Apex Mountain. I don't know, but it's not this. <laughs> like he's. I don't know. He's been a pretty big TV star over the last however many. I don't know. He's had a really Is it long star career. From the Lion yeah. King, maybe. Bruce Willis, I would say, Six Sense is Apex Mountain. Yeah, that's a good call. That's actually a really good call. Maybe M Night Shyamalan makes more credit for that. I don't know. Bruce Willis was also really big in the '80s, though. Die Hard One is like that. Yeah, you know, it's hard to yeah. put this over that. Wait, so you think he was past his apex? That's kind of interesting. He went through phases. Same with Sam. No, Jackson. I know you're right. Yeah. I, I wrote down: Is this is this Apex Mountain for like pre Sam Jackson? Sam Jackson. So like he's such like a Sam Jackson now is such like a joke of like Sam Jackson, right? Yeah, yeah. Like he doesn't play other than like the Marvel movies. He doesn't. He always is just playing like this like the same dude. Yeah. Cartoonish version of himself. Is this yeah. like Apex Mountain for like serious actor Sam Jackson? Yeah, it could maybe. Be. But he was in yeah. like 1990. He was in Mo Better Blues and Goodfellas. 92 Patriot Games. 93 Loaded Weapon, Jurassic Park, True Romance. 94 Pulp Fiction. 95 This. 96 Time to Kill, Long Kiss Goodnight. 97 Jackie Brown. 98 Negotiator. Any yeah, like the, that whole era. Was the first half of those though? movies are, are such minor roles for him. He's not like here. He's like a yeah. co-star. Um, I, don't, I don't know. I don't think it's his Apex Mountain necessarily. Is it I Apex forgot to. For, I don't know. I think if we talk about the problem is that after the Die Hard movies, I don't know if Bruce Willis made another movie that was better Sixth than. Sense. Yeah, I, I, I put Six Sense as kind of a, a classic. I actually think the after, but after is a that, great he movie was, too. I, I, it, it was it was like maybe what he did in Die Hard led up to him being in Six Sense, but after Six Sense. He doesn't do much that's really successful. Wait, so let's go through some of the, some of that movie, some of those movies though. After Die so Hard, after Sixth Sense. After Six Sense, he does the no, story after, of go after Die, Die after Die Hard. Let's go after, after Die, Die Hard, Hard with a Vengeance. He does Twelve Monkeys, Last Man Standing, The Fifth Element, which was a big money movie at the time. Yeah, the Jack, Armageddon. The, the Jack. Jack Armageddon. Armageddon. I would say, Ar- I would say Armageddon. Armageddon is the same effects man. That but movie he, made so much fucking money. He was the draw, but he was the draw for Armageddon. He was one of the reasons that people showed up to watch that movie, and it was because of the Die Hard movies, I think, and the Fifth Element. Like people showed up to watch that because Bruce Willis, Willis was in it, and it was because of the Die Hard franchise. That's what he's known for. But what do you think but he has more he power, power? Hiring power is after Armageddon. The movie yeah. killed. But he didn't. Uh, yeah, he did the fifth. No. The Siege, Breakfast of Champions in the Sixth Sense. And then after that, it's. He said he's had such an illustrious career. It's it's like so it's many hard. maybe peaks yeah. and valleys. It's hard to pinpoint. The last 20 years have been rough. <laughs> yeah. I, I feel like Sixth Sense is literally the last movie that I, I, I saw like Die Hard. All, all of them are like kind of jokes on like Die Hard, like the Expendables, Red. Like it's all the same shit. Yeah. But he's I, still really entertaining when he's on the screen. He's like, he's just a right. true movie star, right? He's right. such a movie star. 
Yeah. Well, when you think of when you think of Bruce Willis, you don't think of anyone but John McClane. Correct. Right? Like that's your first. That's the first thought that comes that's the through. First, you. yeah. Yeah. Who's Bruce Willis? Bruce Willis is not Malcolm yeah. Crow from The Sixth Sense. Bruce Willis is John McClane. So then, Die Hard One is Apex on. If that's your case, we don't really know what the definition of Apex Man yeah, 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 is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, let's just move on. I for, I forgot. Uh, Jeremy Irons was the like the CEO guy in Margin Call. Yeah. It, it was a, he has a great like speech. Great movie. That. Great movie. Great I, I think uh, Samuel Jackson. I mean, Zeus wins the movie for me. Who wins the movie? It's not John oh. McClane. Sorry. Uh, I put Bruce. I, I, I mean, this is the cherry on top of the Die Hard trilogy. It, it's like MJ no. doing the three peat. You don't watch you're gonna this movie hate for that. John McClane. You don't watch this movie for John McClane. You watch it for Zeus. It's the only reason this movie is great. Them playing off each other. It's, it's like Jordan. And yeah, but exactly. He needed it, though. We yeah. already, we already, like, we, we're only getting, like, retread lines and scenes from a character we know and love, whereas, like, Zeus wins the movie. I see. So you walk yeah, out that's, that's fair. like, Samuel Jackson, whoa, who is this Give guy? Give me more of that. Yeah. Yeah. Like, what was that? Yeah. I like that. That's fair. I think you won. What do you got, Andy? I got a nominee. I don't think it, I don't think it beats I don't think it beats Samuel L. Jackson, but I got a nominee for the unseen villain. I think that not knowing who the villain is for the first half of this movie, and the first half of this movie is the only thing that makes this movie incredible. The 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 second half of it is another like above average action movie. But yeah. But you don't see who Simon is, you know that there's a highly intelligent, highly motivated, crazy person on the other end of that phone, and it's terrifying because he knows everything that you're doing, and that trope never gets old. You do um, know it's Jeremy Irons, though. You do, right? But yeah. until you see Jeremy Irons, you're like, well, when I was yeah. another thing is like when I was when I was watching this movie for, for, for the first time. When I was 11 years old, is the year after the Lion King came out, and I asked yeah. my brother, "Why is Scar asking?" <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, but I think that the un, I think the idea of the unseen villain and the the reveal of it, I think that still wins today. It worked in Bond movies. It worked yeah. now. I still watch this movie to to see Samuel L. Jackson screaming, McClane! Yeah, it's really about him. That's a good call. He wins. But it's another nominee. Zeus. <clears throat> I think that's it. I think we did it. Take we us home, Mike. We went longer than the Sandlot by two minutes. So good for us. <laughs> uh, I can't believe it. I can't believe we talked about this movie for two and a half hours. Oh my Die Hard with a Vengeance. Uh, McTiernan, hopefully he can catch us on YouTube and uh, get some closure in his life and get back out there directing action movies because I'd like to see him come back for one more. America loves a comeback story. Let's get He's one more one. from McTiernan. He's got yeah. with, un, with an unseen release date. My guess yeah. is it's going to be fucking terrible. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He hasn't made it. a movie in 20 years. Uh, I'll totally watch it. <laughs> what's next? Can we tease the next? Um, what do we think? I don't even remember what was on our list. So we I just remember can't, can't Hardly Wait was on there. Uh, yeah. Uncle we Buck. Can, we can speculate. Let's speculate. Well, we don't want to. We don't want to give anything we'll away. Marinate. All right. For all, all right, for guys. All yours. <laughs> <laughs> this, oh, is this is fun. Uh. Go watch Live Free or Die Hard and Die Hard 5 this weekend. <laughs> and yeah. you'll appreciate this movie even more. That's all I have to say. <laughs> watch, watch Bruce Willis jump off of a, an F-22 in the middle yes. of L. Yes. Yeah. All right, guys. All right, guys. Enjoy. All right. See ya. See ya. Yippee-ki-yay.